Uh, my friends, what are you doing back here? Found your way to With the Terrible Fates Twitch channel to kick off your weekend. I'm honored that you would take the time. I'm going to do my best to make it worth your while. Welcome to Tales of Praxis. I'm Aaron Saduko, your host, the founder of With the Terrible Fate, your online publication and resource for all of the most rigorous and in-depth studies of video games as works of literature. It's a pleasure to be back uh, on this adventure with you, studying Bandai Namco's Tales series of JRPGs. We've been doing this on the stream for a few months at this point, from the Tales of Symphonia games through to Hysteria, and now it's prequel, along with some more games in the background and plenty of um, thoroughgoing written analyses published to accompany those, with some more coming in the near future. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> I got a jump scare already. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Listen, I, uh, if, if I could frighten you with an unusual opening grail, that already has made my night. So <laughs> I, I have to express gratitude to you for that, if nothing else. Um... I, I, I imagine that most people on the stream beyond Grail will already know Grail at this point as one of our regulars in our intrepid real-life JRPG party, so I won't belabor the point. Uh, already gave a little synopsis as to what Tales of Praxis consists in. Uh, I think we'll be able to jump back in with some renewed speed this evening. I'm just looking over my notes to make sure I cover everything. Pottery breaking! Oh, the gang is getting back together. Everyone's here on a fine Friday evening. Welcome. Oh, I'm excited, y'all. Well, then I'm definitely not going to um, uh, belabor the intro this time around. I'll say just a couple things by way of kicking things off. First, because uh, as you know, I'm playing through a, a speedrun replay of Tales of Arise to get ready for this lecture that With a Terrible Fate is giving at PAX West in Seattle in a couple weeks. Could not be more excited about that. Um, loving Tales of Arise just as much the second time. Everything we've been saying about how much trouble we have remembering second acts is definitely coming back into the forefront of my mind and being reinforced by the fact that uh, despite how much I enjoyed Tales of Arise's second act, I have a surprisingly minimal memory of it, even though I just played through it a couple of years ago. So it's been a delight to revisit that. Um, without too many spoilers, I guess for the benefit of y'all who are watching the stream, I'll say I just reached the point where um, the gang found a spaceship? I guess that's not too big of a spoiler if you don't really know the context. But so that's pretty much at the climax of the second act, which got me thinking more about all of the second act stuff that we discussed uh, at the beginning of the week. And so one thing that I just wanted to foreground as we dig back into Tales of Berseria's second act was you know, when, when I gave that little mini lecture about second acts at the start of the week, um, my kind of toy model for talking about them, I was looking back, it largely centered on kind of the way the plot evolves across the three acts. So I had talked about it in terms of the first act being, you know, we learn about the characters and their conflicts and they set off on a journey where they kind of misunderstand the nature of the world. Then in the second act, they're dealing with the failure of that first journey uh, and they're making a new plan about how to improve the world and each other. And then in the third act, they finally understand what's at the root of those problems and they decide how to resolve those problems in a way that changes the world and empowers them to better understand themselves. And I think that's, it's like a useful heuristic, but uh, as I was reaching the climax of Tales of Arise's second act, it occurred to me there's also maybe a simpler way to frame it in terms of um, focusing on the way that characters evolve across the acts, which really resonates for me with regard to Arise, and I think might be useful for thinking about other Tales games, and maybe even to keep in our minds as we go forward with Berseria, which was why I wanted to mention it, which was... If, um, if we want to think about a three-act structure in something like a Tales game, um, but just explain it in terms of the characters as opposed to the plot, we could say something like the first act would be um, 
you know, that we were introduced to characters and the characters are typically more or less isolated and then their preconceived notions of the world are challenged by meeting others. So the first act is oftentimes where you get a lot of that cross-pollination as you build up the JRPG party, whether that's the fictional one or the real life one we're building on Tales of Praxis. And then the second act would be deciding who we really are and what we want before we know what the world is actually like. And again, this really struck me in Arise because I, I think one of the things that's really touching to me about its second act is it's very clear and the characters very clearly understand that they don't really understand at that point what is at stake in like the broad interstellar conflict between Dana and Rena because they know enough about the world to understand what it is they don't know. But they put in a lot of the interpersonal work in order to decide, look, whatever the world ends up being like, this is what we care about and this is what we want to achieve. And then it's only in the third act where once they discover the world's true nature, they apply that resolve that they arrived at in the second act in order to realize new versions of themselves in the new world that they want to create. So that struck me as something that I think might be a little simpler as a way of framing the three act structure. And also is kind of when you think of it that way, especially like reaching a decision point about what you want to do before you really understand how the world is. There's just, there's something about that to me that feels very tales in terms of a lot of the themes that the games are wrestling with um, and, and kind of beautiful for that. And so is perhaps worth keeping in mind as we move on with Berseria. Uh, Evie, my dog, clearly has some points of contention and disagreement based on the way she's grumbling in the background. But uh, we're, we're going to have some thunderstorms, I think, this evening in Colorado. So she, uh, she might be grumbly for the duration. We'll, uh, we'll make do. We always do. But that was food for thought. Um, ha, well, Grail, I think I mentioned this last time when I say speed through for a rise, um, it really is a speed through in the sense that in contrast to the other replays that I've done for Tales of Praxis so far, this was one where, because I really did just want to get the story and experience fresh in my head for the lecture, I actually did New Game Plus it. And Tales of Arise was one, like most of them, where my first time playing it, I really put in the work to do, you know, max level do everything, max nonsense. Um, and in Tales of Arise, you might remember, they make it even easier to carry over all of that stuff to New Game Plus than the Tales games do with a typical grade shop. And so it's very easy to just absolutely mow down every enemy, um, not worry about a lot of the side quests because most of them don't bear directly on the plot. Um, so I'm almost a little embarrassed at how quickly I'm going through it. Although I, it's, it's all relative, right? I mean, I say quickly, but I've probably put in like 25 ish hours to it so far. So it's like, <laughs> it's all in how you look at it. Um, but I do, I mean, I would say on the whole, and I imagine most JRPG players like yourselves feel this way too. There's, there's something special about being able to just live in and experience these worlds um, and reflect on the growth of the characters and the trajectory of the story over a significant chunk of time. I think when a JRPG is told just right, especially one of the longer ones, it uses that length to make the experience more meaningful uh, rather than something that's distracting or exhausting. Like, this is kind of how I felt playing through the definitive edition of Vesperia because I've kind of, I've ragged on it a little for being so much longer than the average Tales game, but I think I really enjoyed it for that. So it's, it's not my habit and not my preference to rush through them that quickly. Uh, and I wouldn't say that's typical of how I'm approaching them for Tales of Praxis. I think, you know, it's more the case that I'm going through them at this speed just because, you know, we're doing Tales of Praxis and this is a big flagship or mothership title, if you will, for With a Terrible Fate. And so uh, I'm enjoying the continuous research uh, and commentary process and hopefully you all are too. But Tales of Arise is definitely an exception to the rule, but I think it's one that definitely sits well with just the themes of aggressive confrontation of everything that you want to challenge in the world, which is so essential to a lot of the story that Arise wants to tell. So I think uh, if, if, if there were going to be one that I was going to rush through relative to the others, it feels at least thematically consonant that it would be Tales of Arise for what that's worth. Pink Moon Neko, welcome back. It is a delight to, uh, to see you back in the chat, my friend. Um, we're, we're getting ready to dive back into Berseria, uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to have you back in the chat.
Yeah, pottery breaking, I get what you mean. I think definitely coming back into a rise after doing a lot of them, like um, Tales of Symphonia, especially. Um, yeah, mostly Tales of Symphonia, actually, because that's such a great contrast case. Uh, it's it's definitely a differently structured game in terms of making it much easier to see everything and experience everything on the first playthrough. I will say, um, especially after having taken the time to as you know, very recently replay a lot of the other Tales games, even though it hasn't been that long since I played Arise for the first time. A lot of it feels fresh, and a lot of it I'm having different perspectives on. So even if you feel like you saw it all the first time, um, if you know if one person's opinion is going to make a difference in whether or not you replay it, I would say I'm getting a lot out of it on the replay still, uh, even though it's a different sort of replay than a lot of Tales replays. So uh, I, I would still consider it. Um, all the same. Yeah, Grail, uh, I, I wanted to ask, because I was keeping in mind as I was playing through, uh, you're asking about my opinion on law. I'm happy to give it. Uh, I have a lot of opinions on law, but I wanted to kind of put the ball in your court first because I wanted to ask you, um, why was it that you were asking and, and kind of what is your position on law? Because I want to make sure to modulate my commentary appropriately. But don't worry, whatever your views are, I mean, you know me well enough at this point to know that uh, you will not, <laughs> you won't color my views too much. But I, uh, yeah, I want to know what it w was that you were thinking in that regard. Yeah, I feel you, Pottery Breaking. And I think that's a great um, case of how it's different than a lot of the games. Because I've said on the last few streams with something like Symphonia, it's almost part and parcel of the game that it's not enough to play through at once. Like if you're playing through Symphonia and paying attention, you're not going to feel done when the credits roll. You're going to want to go back in and do several new game pluses at least, uh, and Arise is very differently structured. So I think that's a very fair point. Um, Pink Moon Echo, last time we were on this little um, kind of side mission in the main story, you might recall, um, of the second act of Berseria. So the gang was traveling initially to find Magilu's contact, um, Grimoire, who she claimed would be able to translate the text that Lafayette found to learn more about Enominad and the nature of the Abbey and everything. Um, but then everyone came down with the Corsair Scourge, or all the humans did at least, and so they had to figure out um, how to cure everyone and prevent them from dying off before they moved on. So we found the herb that was required to make that remedy, the Salatoma, I believe it was called, we also found another um, demon who was constricted within a barrier, similar to the other one that we found within the Abbey. Um, we were able to, I guess it's right to say, quell it. Uh, not in quite the same way as a shepherd would, but something similar where it was a demon and then it was a little cute bug uh, whom Luffy said kind of bef befriended and decided to take along in the journey. And then we also went through a, um, a confrontation with Melchior, that was the other big set piece of the last stream where um, the Abbey had set a trap for Zavid and Aizen had gone after Zavid and so the rest of the party went after Aizen and it was a domino effect. Um, but we ended up shattering the illusions that Melchior had conjured uh, and learning a lot more about Zavid's history uh, and what Eifried meant to Aizen and Zavid. Uh, and now we are back at the ship, ready to resume our initial mission to find um, Grimoire. And I think that catches you up more or less, but if there are any holes that you need filling, um, let me know. Happy to speak more to those. Are you... Grail, I'm interested, are you, because I mean, I, I, I don't engage that much in the fandom. Um, when you say the scene in the fourth realm, are you talking about like the centerpiece scene where Law prevents Rinwell from enacting her revenge? Because it, it shocks me that people would crap on Law as a character for that. I, um, I was actually going to say that's one of the set pieces that really speaks to his character for me and is especially memorable and moving in terms of the like the overall story of Arise and what it is that it's trying to say. Um, we can definitely talk more about Law and Arise if we want to as we move through this stream. I guess what I'll say by way of kicking things off before we dive back into Berseria on the subject of Law is I think 
the thing that is really cool to me that I'm kind of sitting with this time, because I, I really enjoyed Law as a character the first time around, and I don't want to spoil some of the later game reasons that that's the case, but even just starting out with him, I think he's a really interesting case study where there are lots of characters and lots of stories who have to deal with like the loss of loved ones at some point in the story. I think Law, uh, even among the JRPGs and the Tales games that I've played, he's an interesting and unusual case in the sense that kind of his entire arc is defined by that loss where we first engage with him basically right as he is on the cusp of losing like a, a loved one and a key figure in his life. And so like his entire journey with us is colored by coming to terms with the loss of someone close to him, uh, a loss that he didn't even really understand in the first place, and then ultimately moving beyond that and figuring out how to be his own man. And I think the way in which he navigates that with the support of someone like Alfin taking a brotherly role and Renwell as someone who sort of has had like a, a parallel um, but almost complementary sense of loss in a lot of ways, I think it's really touching and thoughtful. So. I love his resolve. I love how much he's willing to fight through, but I think there's a lot of subtlety to the way in which he navigates those personal challenges, especially when he's relatively young to be dealing with stuff like the weight of sin and not understanding what it means to lose a family member, but having to take on that burden and grow up too quickly and all of that stuff. So I'd say big fan of law. And I would say, I, I, yeah, I, I don't get people who don't like that scene. I mean, I would, I would ask those people to show their work. I mean, everyone is entitled to their opinion, but um, uh, I'll, I'll just say, especially having come off the recent Tales games, like I don't remember that scene resonating with me as much the first time I played it, but this time, like it really sat super well with me. I think the idea, especially where without going too much into the details of the scene to spoil too much, the fact that Law expresses very clearly, like. I don't, I don't even really know why this is the thing that I feel like I have to do right now for you, Renwell, um, but I know that I have to do it, and I'm sorry, and I hope you can forgive me. I think that ability to sort of like sense that something is right without even being able to rationalize or articulate the reason behind it, I think that's something that strikes me as really true to Law's character and is an interesting way of showing how sometimes when people are in the right circumstances, growth is kind of forced upon them before they even understand what that growth entails, which I think ties into a lot of what I was just saying in terms of how he especially figures out how to cope with the, um, the loss of a loved one and everything like that. So big fan of that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm glad to have y'all as a little window into the discourse because I, um, like I said, I kind of stay out of it. Uh, this doesn't <laughs> encourage me to get deeper into it because I, uh, yeah, I get that, you know, especially if you're a longtime fan of a series, it can almost feel like a badge of honor to be able to be critical of the latest one by comparing it to the later games. I don't think that's fair. And I also just, I mean, I think it's kind of myopic, even in terms of your own relationship with the series. Like I was talking with someone who's interested in, um, contributing to With a Terrible Fate as an analyst a couple days ago, and I was reflecting on kind of the way With a Terrible Fate has grown over time, because we started off in very broad terms as a publication just talking about the storytelling of video games, and so earlier in our history, those commentaries that we wrote would be critical, sometimes in favor of games, sometimes trying to sort of tear the storytelling of a game apart in one way or another. And we've kind of moved away from that, because as I've spent more time with games and thinking about the theory of it and everything and just growing up and having more experiences in my own life. I just feel like life is way too short to go out of your way to be like critical and uh, just like predisposed to tear down the stories and artwork of games or, or just other, um, other cultural artifacts like that. And especially when it's within the context of a series that you care about and you're invested in, I just, I, I don't see why your first impulse would be to like criticize it as opposed to try to situate it within the series in a way that highlights what it is that it's trying to say and what it does in a special way that's maybe different from other games, but uh, in a sense that can be rewarding to you. It's a lot of what we talked about in Dawn of the New World and even Zestiria, right? Where um, in the Tales games, for example, when they do diverge uh, in marked ways from the other entries in the series, like 
dawn of the new world's choice mechanics or the one-on-one relationship or the you know armatization of tales of zisteria any number of things like that like yeah your first reaction could be to criticize the game by saying it's different than the others but also there's probably an intention behind why it's diverging from the norm of the series and maybe that's actually core to what it is that it's trying to impress so why would you not take the time to interrogate that and think about what the point of that is, especially if you have the background of the other games uh, to understand why that might be a really cool and thoughtful divergence. Uh, it, it can take a little more work, but I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like A, it's more productive, and B, it also like can give you some positive appreciation for more of the games in a series that you care about, as opposed to just dismissing them out of, the, out of hand for the sake of I'd, uh, trying to showcase your expertise, which it never comes off to me that way anyway. So I don't know. I don't, this, this is reminding me of when Grail um, shared that Reddit post with me the other day about how someone had a hot take that Luke's character was best in the first act of Tales of the Abyss. Like, hey, you can say that, but why would you? Like, what, what purpose does that serve? Um, but... We're here for a different sort of purpose and a different sort of engagement with these games. So hopefully um, Tales of Praxis can be a little bit of a panacea bottle to that, <laughs> that impulse as we play through these games to the extent that one has that impulse. Grail, I will always read commentary that you write about these games. Same goes for everyone on uh, on the stream. So if you want to, you should. I think as as we're engaging more with Berseria in the chat and getting ready to dive in, uh, the one other thing I wanted to kick off the stream with was, you know, I've been foregrounding these streams with a lot of my commentary and thinking on the games. Uh, but as we dive back into the second act, I wanted to just take the temperature of the gang, especially as we're starting to amass a, a little bit more of critical mass in terms of, you know, people in the chat and the real life JRPG party. You now, what are like, you know, with the understanding that maybe you've played through Berseria before, maybe not, given where we are in the story right now and where the characters are, what are the main questions that are on your mind, either in terms of, you know, where the story is going to go or what the characters are wrestling with, or more broadly, like how Tales of Berseria is situated in the broader tale series? Um, like, I, I have my own thoughts about the game that I've been weighing and thinking about and talking quite a bit about, but I want to take the temperature of the room in terms of what the most pressing things in the game seem to be right now as we're muddling through the second act, which we've talked about how that runs the risk of being kind of forgettable, and we want to try to avoid that and appreciate the second act for all the places in which it takes us. So I will leave that question with the group, um, take stock of your responses as we dive into this, uh, but without further ado, welcome you back again to Tales of Praxis. And we'll get into it. Starting off with the most important piece of gameplay, of course, seeing the outcome of our last expedition. Take a look at this. That's about right. <laughs> I don't know why I expected anything else. Oh, I think the last time might have been the uh, the first time we did the Force Islands. I don't forget. Uh, excuse me, I don't remember whether I read the description or not, so I'll just do it while we're on the page anyway. A kingdom governed by two races once spanned these islands. The kingdom is gone, but a tragic tale of romance between... Oh my god. Come on. Between a queen and a knight of different races. Still told today. Here you go. I don't think I read that. I feel like I would remember it. There you go, Grail. Yeah, and I, we've talked to death how I think both you and I aren't especially fans of this battle system, especially in the broader context of the Tales series, but um, that's a good opportunity for us to check back in on Velvet because we've been thinking a lot about other characters like Aizen and Zavid over the last couple streams, but as we're working our way through the second act and sort of very slowly, I guess, seeing more faces of Velvet, let's take your temperature. How, uh, how are you feeling about her so far in the context of the stream? Are you still 
Uh, not the biggest fan of her. Are you thinking about her in new ways? <laughs> I mean, at this point, Grail, I, I feel like the bet would be in favor of that rather than not. <laughs> that seems to be the uh, the case with the last couple of those islands. Oh yeah, we also unlocked the first class four zone at the end of last stream, which is a, a challenge area with demons who are so tough that the Abbey has just given up on it because it's not close to civilization. I think for now, for the sake of advancing the act, I'd say let's let's go on with the main story, but it's good to keep that in our back pocket when we're interested in changing things up. Yeah, I'm glad that you appreciate the streams for that reason, Pottery Breaking. I think, you know, one thing that'll be good for us to keep in mind, and I know we've talked about this a little bit on the past streams, uh, but as we go forward, it's just thinking about, you know, ways in which as we get a different beat on the story, that might lead us to see the gameplay in slightly different ways, even if it's not our favorite gameplay at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely glad I can give you another lens into these. I know, especially when you're expecting something different from the gameplay, it can be really hard to absorb and think about the story in the same way. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that, Grail. I think it's also really easy. I don't know if it's just because they're so long, but I feel like, especially when you're reflecting on a Tales game or a JRPG that you haven't played in a while, it's easy to kind of bias your perspective on the characters according to how they represent themselves in the first act. Like what you just said about Velvet feels very first act Velvet to me. Um, and a lot of what I remembered about, for instance, Alfin and Shion or people in Tales of Arise were largely colored by the way they present themselves in the first act. And of course, that's not fair because the whole point of these stories is that they have arcs as characters and they grow and they change their minds about things. Uh, but that's that can be one of the reasons as much as anything why it's valuable to replay them because I think it's it's easy to turn a character into a caricature in your memory um, because it's, it's easier to just hold that initial model of them or maybe where they ultimately end up in your mind as opposed to the overall like development that they represent. But the development is always so much more interesting, I think, at least if the story is well told. That wasn't the real I freed. But I'm glad everyone on the ship is feeling better. Yeah, though it sounds like they never want to touch that Salatoma stuff ever again. <laughs> What about Eleanor? She took it too, and her face went all wow. I don't mean how she looked. I mean how she actually feels. Oh, well, she looks like she. Feels Velvet like actually cares good. about how Eleanor feels. You're worried about her, aren't you? Gasp! No, it's nothing like that. Well, let me tell you something, kiddo. When young maidens ripen, they have trouble expressing their feelings. Ugh. So Velvet's ripen? What a way to describe people growing up. Young maidens thoughts. ripening. <laughs> no trouble expressing those feelings, I see. I think one thing that's interesting too, uh, since we're, we're talking about Velvet's development, maybe this can be something to keep in mind as we go forward, because we haven't talked about this explicitly on the stream yet, but you know, we talked about how at the beginning of the second act in Berseria, um, you know, Velvet has missed the opportunity to get revenge on Artorias, and as she's picking up the pieces and trying to figure out what will give her reason going forward uh, to live and persist and everything like that, uh, she immediately attaches to the idea of defending and protecting Lafayette because that's one of her first jobs in the second act is to carry the collapsed Lafayette through the Earth Pulse in which they find themselves. Um, one thing that's been interesting to keep track of over the last couple streams is clearly there's also some kind of relationship of attachment or investment or just caring about one another between Eleanor and Lafayette. And of course, Eleanor has this, you know, um, ulterior motive of ultimately bringing Lafayette to Artorias, but I think even in spite of that, there's something clearly genuine between them, and also something that is different than the relationship between Lafayette and Velvet, because that kind of comes out in how Velvet is 
jealous of the relationship that Eleanor is cultivating with Lafayette and how Velvet ends up becoming all the more protective and possessive of Lafayette as a result of that. So I think that little skit we just saw is an interesting lens into that, where if we think about Velvet's trajectory as moving from you know, obsession with revenge to figuring out how to care about others beyond herself or Artorias as the object of her revenge, you know, it's, it's easy to initially project onto Lafayette and you know, just think about the opportunity to redeem herself for the loss of her brother at the beginning of the game, but now she seems to almost be using that attachment to Lafayette as a conduit to relate to other people beyond him. Like now it seems, even though she was initially maybe jealous of Eleanor, because Eleanor also has that relationship with Lafayette, Lafayette can be this kind of intermediary entity that then gives Velvet a means of access and relation to Eleanor. So even kind of in spite of herself, Velvet is beginning to care about and think about Eleanor as a person, even though Eleanor is an exorcist and putatively her enemy. So it's interesting to see how she's kind of gradually, by degrees, growing and, and caring about other people in spite of herself, just by virtue of how the party is evolving across the course of their journey. supposed to exist to bring peace and order to the world. Yeah, I want to keep up with the Code Red demon fights for that reason, Grail. Definitely. It ought to be rooted in that mission. And yet, something just doesn't feel right here. Yeah, that's a great point, Pottery Breaking. I think it's totally bi-directional. That knowledge is not... Her showing that she has the capacity to invest in someone else definitely um, projects something different that the other party members can attach to as they relate to her. To Velvet, I mean. Oh, easy there. Just asking. S sorry, I was just deep in thought. Is there something you need from me? Nah, just heard a bunch of sighs and wondered if you were feeling sick or anything. No, I drank my solitoma juice. Ah, tasted like crap, didn't it? It, it wasn't that bad. Hey. What? Are you afraid of demons? No, I, I am not. It's more like I despise them. Ten years ago, a group of them attacked my village. They destroyed everything and everyone. Including your family? Yes. The only family I had at that point was my mother. And in all the chaos, she... Chaos. Keyword. Age of Chaos. All I have left of her is this hand mirror she gave me. I didn't want anyone else to have to feel the way I did. And so I became an exorcist in order to destroy demons. So you can keep your pity. Gotcha. I will then. <laughs> Notice, too, that's really interesting backstory for me because it shows, you know, speaking of Velvet and Eleanor being opposite sides of the same coin in terms of their relationship with Lafayette and everything, for both Eleanor and Velvet, their entire families and homes and everything they knew were destroyed by the advent of Demon Blight and all of that chaos. And even though, on the one hand, it seems like they took different paths because Velvet was made into a demon and obsessed over revenge, and Eleanor tried to overcome that by becoming an exorcist and destroying demons, they kind of took the exact same path because they tried to cope with that instead of really processing their grief and healing in a healthy way by obsessing with some means to sort of overcome or erase that tragedy in their history. Um, Velvet by getting revenge on the man who brought it about in the first place and Eleanor by taking up arms against every other demon. So they're almost trying to undo that part of their past as opposed to figuring out how to live in this new world and project the best version of themselves. So that's, that's interesting color to relate Eleanor to Velvet in a different way. called a pangyon, a type of bird native to this area. 
Just call it a penguinus, dude. Pengion. Don't give us another term. And tender. It makes a lovely stew. Wow, what's it taste like? You'd eat that poor thing? Savage. <laughs> Although pottery breaking, as we've been talking about the last couple of streams, Eleanor has kind of been de facto banished by the Abbey, even though she seems to think she's doing it under the charge of Artorias. So I don't, it's jury's out on whether only one of them is branded, I think. <laughs> But that's kind of the charming irony that's being set up, at least so far in the story, right, Grail? Is the fact that even Lafayette, even though Lafayette number one was 86, they have this opportunity to uh, somewhat naturally become bonded over Lafayette number two. <laughs> Demon. It was one of my mother's specialties. All right, enough of oh. the chit chat. Magilu. What's this grimoire friend of yours like? Hmm. Well, how do I put it? <sighs> oh. You know, like that. <laughs> ah, yes. Now we all understand. Uh, well, to put it in a way those of meager imagination can understand, Grim's got a sort of listless aristocratic air about her. A noble woman in her twilight, you could say. Huh. So you mean, like, a woman, but different from Velvet and Eleanor. <laughs> You're not wrong there. I tell you what, just keep an eye out for a grown woman. A uh, grown woman? Okay, I got it. Well, since we got her name, we could start by asking around. Exactly. Now you're talking. <sighs> What's up, kiddo? Magilu, you're a grown woman yourself. So why is it you have trouble clearly expressing your real feelings? Damn. <laughs> Calling Magilu out. Good I love it. question. Put simply, a long time ago, mine broke. Bye-bye. I'll take most zealous things to say for 400, Alex. Come on. Let's question the townsfolk. That was a great shot. I should have tried to freeze on it also, but the image of Lafayette with Eleanor over one of his shoulders and Velvet over the other, like the angel and the devil trying to convince you of the right thing to do. Not to be too on the nose about it, but it was right there after all. <laughs> yeah, if anyone else, Grail, but for Magilu, it's little bit of par for the course, isn't it, Just? Mm. Let's talk to this fella. Oh no! Not Demon Blight in the sea. As we talked about a couple streams ago, the sea is a metaphor for all that is good and positive in the world. If Demon Blight takes that, there's no hope. This reminds me a little bit of the, um, the Destiny Islands from Kingdom Hearts. Or I would also accept the, um, the first town that, um, Titus shows up at after he kind of goes through the portal at the start of Final Fantasy X, where he meets Yuna. I'm, it's been a minute since I played that, so I'm blanking on the name of that town, but a similar tropical vibe.
Yeah, I was actually thinking of trying out Mogilu after last stream pottery breaking, so we're kind of on the same wavelength. Maybe, actually, maybe this will be the stream. Maybe I'll try her out a little bit more. Which Breath of the Wild place are you thinking of, Grail? This doesn't feel Palma Costa to me. This feels too much like Tropical Island. Like, Palma Costa is a coastal town, but it feels much more like a city. Whereas this feels almost evocative of Hawaii or something similar. <laughs> All right, pottery breaking. Well, you might have convinced me. Maybe, in fact, why am I talking about it? Why don't we just fine, fine. try a girl out? A shall we be off, my morbid menagerie? We shall, my specious witch. Lurlin, okay. It's been a minute, I'll admit, since I've played Breath of the Wild. I'll take your word for it. So how do you like our island? Nice and laid back, right? It's quite a bit different from Logris. This place was even more relaxed before the opening. Oh, come on, but Grail. It'd be too easy if that were the case. Have gone -eyed you about might the run the risk of enjoying the combat. In the lurch. It's still better than it was when the demons first started showing up. We have the Abbey to thank for that. And because people are traveling more now, the need for ships has skyrocketed. Our lumber industry is booming. In other words, when the money started flowing, people let it go to their heads? That and those exorcists and soldiers from the bigger cities, they really seemed sophisticated. People from the other islands wear different clothes and have things we don't, you know? Getting worked up and worked over by what's trendy. Is that foolishness not the very definition of youth? If this keeps up, our island's traditions will fade away. That's what worries me. I understand how you feel, but you have to give young people the freedom to be themselves. <laughs> yeah, I'll be excited to try out this break soul. Reminds me a little bit, I'd forgotten um, Renwell's special technique in Tales of Arise, which is very similar in terms of literally stealing enemy spells, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> That's a good formula for assuming no accountability for your actions, Grail. <laughs> Pottery breaking, you are absolutely correct. Good on you for calling Grail out. <laughs> Don't let him get away with that. Not even some kind of challenge run. Grail, why don't you, for the benefit of the group, remind everyone of the exact kind of challenge run that you're doing because it is hot nonsense, to say the least. Oh, wow. I didn't even realize we had completed nine of the code red hunts at this point those stack up quicker than you even realize it <laughs> grail that's like by that flaccid logic you could also say it's the game's fault because the game gives you the option to play as her Therefore, if you have a bad time, it's only because of the game. <laughs> oh, did I walk by a chest, Pink Moon Echo? Can always count on you for that. Where was it? I don't see a chest. started. I don't think we went down here yet.
Red lavender. Don't mind if I do. Yeah, so I've been calling that for fairly obvious reasons the Nuzlocke of the Tales games because that's the only apt comparison I can make. But yeah, if you're going to do a nuts challenge run, I feel like Grail is the best model for that. Come, sinner, and repent to your wicked deeds. Damn, good call, Grail. <laughs> we almost missed one of the biggest L's. <laughs> you look so deeply sinful, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Now confess. Oh, how long have I waited to bear my soul to someone? But I've always lacked the courage. Praise be to the Empyreans who have bestowed upon me this gem today. <laughs> ah, your devotion to the Empyreans is most... No, it is you who has captured my devotion, my darling. There's no one else I want but you. What? M me? But... My life is I'm going to fuck the Empyreans out of you as a joke. I want you to look at me the way I look at you. Hold me, darling. Smother me in your embrace. Uh, I don't. I. I. Those were the kind of lines I read in a romance novel. <laughs> it wasn't even that exciting a book. I wasted so many hours with that piece of trash. Please forgive me for not putting myself to better use. Ah, lying to a priest. How could you? Oh, no. I meant to confess my sins, but instead my confession was another sin. Damn. Forgive me, Father. I've transgressed once more. I don't want to forgive you. <laughs> Irony can be so painful. This is fun. I don't think I clocked that these exclamation point interactions vary based on which character you have as the lead. That's some nice variation based on who you decide to lead the party. Come, sinner. Who? Me? I don't think I've done much that Oh, but then we get other conversations if we if we go back you to him. That's cool. Mistaken, for I can tell just from how you dress that a great many sins weigh heavily upon your heart. But it's not too late for you yet. You must confess your sins and repent. Yeah, I hear you, but I really can't think of anything. Have you ever wielded violence? No. All I wield are my swords. <laughs> well, Damn, have you got him. Anybody with your swords? Yeah, but I haven't been able to land a killing blow yet. I've still got a long way to go. But the next time, I'll kill him. No, no, you have it all wrong. You must repent for how you. I think for me, the swords. priest falls more into the camp oh, of generic idiot as opposed to friend. specifically but racist. That's not what I meant either. Ah, and what do you mean? It's a priest's job to guide Like he's equally right misguided to with regard to anyone to whom he could possibly you speak. Anyone to trust your advice. Get your act together, man. E yes. I'll reflect upon the error of my ways. Wait, what? <laughs> damn. It turns out it was I who had to repent the whole damn time. And that's how Rokuro single-handedly reformed the Abbey. That's the real end of the game right there. We did it, guys. So, this is not related to Berseria, but it was this. another question I wanted to canvas the group about with regard to Arise, because I have to know if I'm the only one who has this experience. Um, and if I am, that's okay. I'm willing for it to just be a me problem as opposed to a Tales of Arise problem, but you know, I feel like I have a lot of endurance and intensity of engagement with the overwhelming amount of content in a Tales game because you know, it's, it's what I do. I, I, I've clocked a lot of hours and so I'm able to attend to all of that uh, even and especially when it comes to the skits and all of the optional content that it gives. But for whatever reason, when it comes to Arise, I almost have this experience of having like 
something like ADD when it comes to all of the skits they have. Like I'll, I'll be paying attention, but then I'll clock myself losing focus and have to remind myself to actually like pay a lot of attention to what they're talking about or else I'll miss it and dialogue will just go by. So I, I wonder whether anyone else has that same experience and maybe if it's something to do with the skit structure or if it's really just an Aaron problem in Tales of Arise for some reason. Oh, interesting pottery breaking. So you think maybe it's just a problem of uneven volume. Yeah, I don't have the quite the same comedy bias as you do, Grail. I think the thing that I kind of noticed today as I was trying to think about it, and I don't know whether this is the right thing to say about it, but I feel like sometimes in Arise more so than other games or stories, especially in the skits, like there'll be a lot of talking and a lot of dialogue and cut-ins to say like the same thing three or four different ways. And so there's like an illusion of progress, but actually the conversation isn't advancing very much. And so I wonder whether that's part of why I tune out. But again, I might be being unfair. I just, I, I remembered experiencing that my first time through as I was going through the second playthrough. So that was what made me think maybe it's something about the game and not just what my state of mind was the first time. Yeah, that makes sense, pottery breaking. Maybe that's part of it. Still no leads on that grimoire lady. I'm gonna take Grail's lead and, and call you pottery Watch instead of pottery breaking. I think that'll roll off the tongue better. Hmm, hard to say. It must have been last year? A decade ago? Take this seriously or I'll feed you to the sharks. Oh what? I think I'd at least read a kraken. Keep the fucking <laughs> I swear I'll eat. It's them. The final preparations are complete. Once you've assumed your new post, everyone will act on your command. It's so sad that poor Oscar still has only one functional eye. <laughs> but to be honest, I worry that these shoes I'm filling might just be a bit too big for me. You need not worry. You possess a special strength and quality that others lack. Yeah, that as much as anything is reassuring to me, Pottery, so thank you. Deployment to Polymedes. Fear not. Just be yourself and you'll do fine. Believe you're a leader. <laughs> yeah, I remember Grail from the first time yes. you were saying that. I'll try to make you proud, sister. They're sending him to Polymedes? Is that the name of a facility on this island? I had better get going. Safe travels. Oh, one more thing. Be careful around the demon in Haria. It's stronger than it looks. We've even had some casualties. Understood. Also, if you must drink the water, remember to boil it. Sister. Sister mom. Taking care of her brother. <laughs> I know, I know. I worry too much. But I just Is she just it. velvet with Luffy set? So there's a demon in Haria. It sounds like it's a pretty feisty one, too. If so, it may prove useful. Still. What magical timing for Oscar to show up here at the very same hour we do. I understand your suspicion of me, but have you any proof? None, it's true. But as an exorcist, you're certainly sympathetic to the Abbey's cause. Yeah, I mean, I think her identity as an exorcist would constitute proof for me, or justification at least. Snitching on us, I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, it's almost it's almost like Velvet is the focal point of the game, Grail. <laughs> no, that can't be right. No, I don't. I I always stay outside when 
she's taking a bath. And... <laughs> then isn't it possible she's communicating with the Abbey in secret while you're not there? Boy, Magula is really pushing an agenda this stream. <laughs> you pledged to obey me until the day you die, correct? Yes, that I did. Remember, when you two trade blows, only the Abbey wins. One less demon, one less traitor for them to worry about. While we're standing around here arguing, that demon could be attacking Grimoire! <sighs> it's true. Let's find some more people to question around town. <laughs> She's doing something. I think it's a testament to Magilu that she somehow finds a way to be pure chaos even within the context of an extremely chaotic party. Like she's just a cut above the rest. So what's it really like? Speaking of skits. The connection between Moloch and Vessel. Do you share like thoughts and feelings? Um, sort of. When I'm dwelling inside Eleanor, I can see what she sees and hear what she hears. But I can't read her thoughts or her emotions. Sitting in a box doesn't teach you how the box feels. I see. That's pretty profound. In that case, I want to give her as little time alone as possible. Uh, I don't want to bathe with her, alright? <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. You're a boy and all. For her baths, we can send Bienfu. No, that's a bad idea. It'll have to be Mogulu. Boy, we're really doubling yes. down on this joke, aren't we? <laughs> What sort of boundaries have you and Eleanor drawn? How do you sleep? We talk before bed sometimes, but it's not like I'm sleeping by her side or anything. It's easier for me to tell when she wakes up if I'm dwelling inside her. Does she ever get out of bed at night? Oh, not that's night. weirdly <laughs> ominous, Grail. <She's laughs> I don't know if I'm looking forward to that or, or fearing it. When she's around you Time guys, will tell, I guess. She always looks so stern, but when she's sleeping, her expression is... Softer, you could say. She lets her hair down too, and I think it's kind of prettier that way. Huh. So that's what he likes. Well, keep an eye on her, but. But? Watch out for the older girls. Huh? Teresa and Oscar sure seem close. I've known them since I was an initiate, but I've never seen them quarrel, not even once. Did you ever fight with your brother, Velvet? Yeah, I guess I did. Sometimes I'd chew him out. <laughs> yeah, Aston answered Grail. Exactly. But I found that adorable, too. You did? No matter how much he dug in his heels, or tried to talk like he was in charge, after a while he'd be right there trailing along behind me. Like a little puppy dog. Puppies are a lot more obedient. I always had to keep an eye on him. Little brothers are odd creatures. Rokuro's a little brother. Is he adorable too? <gasps> I don't think a little brother who's out to kill you is in any way adorable. I mean, Shigure might Shigure think he's adorable. Like he was having fun. Yeah, I was gonna say. Sometimes <laughs> that tracks. just don't make sense. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> little brothers. Do you have any siblings? I'm an only child. Well then, that's perfect. You pretend the boy is your little brother. Huh? That's a bit extreme, but actually, when I'm talking with Lavi Set, sometimes I think this is what having a brother must feel like. I could be Eleanor's brother. Don't take any of this nonsense seriously, Lavi Set. Malakim are just tools to exorcists. She can never think of you as her brother. Oh, yeah. You're wrong. I've changed how I view Malakim. I know that's true because I can think of him as a brother. Tell us how it goes, Grail. Right. Tell us how it goes. She's all talk. Don't believe her. It seems to me like you're the one who's treating him as a tool by forcing your own opinions upon him. Ooh, two sisters struggling for the affections of their brother. Amy Teeny Candlestick, which one will the That's what I was going to say, Magulu. Stop stealing all my lines. How about an older brother instead? <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, just to close the loop quickly on the Tales of Arise skit discussion so we can move on. I feel like I feel like part of what's frustrating to me about it is there are a lot of aspects of, while well, we're just talking specifically about the skits, there are a lot of aspects of that system that I really like. like I think the, the blue kind of watercolor collage background is a really nice um, interstitial to separate it from the rest of the game for me. Um, and I love what they do with the different bits of skit development and intimate relationships between Alfin and the rest of the party members in the campfire scenes that unfold across the course of the game. So I feel like there's so much that works for it, which is part of why I keep trying to diagnose and understand my frustration or lack of engagement with other parts of it, because I feel like I don't want to tune out. It's like as, as close as I focus, like my brain resists it for some reason, which is not the best experience. What does it mean to become an adult? <laughs> the eternal question of youth. Have you ever heard of the ceremony of adulthood? It's a yearly tradition on this island. If I remember right, it's totally wild. Everyone throws bananas and porringes at each other. Traditionally, yes, but things have changed over the years. Bananas and porringes are a thing of the past. People are always reaching for bigger and better things, right? In this case, it's watermelons. Whole watermelons. Oh my goodness. You're throwing watermelons? That's gotta hurt. Trust me, I know. But watermelons are the least of our worries. Recently, people have started flinging coconuts. Coconuts? Those things are as hard as rocks! Trust me, I know. <laughs> like getting hit with a brick. Now, every year, there are some kids who never make it to adulthood. You don't mean they... Yeah, I've kept putting it off myself, but it looks like this year I've got no choice but to participate. That's crazy. It's far too dangerous. And more importantly, how does it make someone an adult? There are ancient traditions that say overcoming danger marks a child's coming of age. Some people still cling to the old ways. You've hit the nail on the head. There are lots of old folks that sit around complaining how weak a star kids are. The hypocrites. Back then, they used <laughs> bananas and watermelons. They even cracked the watermelons ahead of time. I don't think cracking a coconut would help much either. So that's why you're standing about looking blue. I'm so ashamed of myself for being scared. If you don't want to do the ceremony, why not just skip it? I'd love to, but I don't really have a choice. I wouldn't be able to show my face around here if I chickened out. Having the courage to say no to something you don't feel is right. Isn't that the true mark of an adult? Wait. You're right! <laughs> now I can finally become an adult! Oh, yeah! Look how grown up I am! <laughs> and getting carried away with yourself and acting the fool is the true mark of immaturity. Sorry. You're right. That's how I start every day. I wake up and shout, Look at how grown up I am! That's how you know you're a grown up. Yeah, Pottery, I think I've talked on the stream before about how, especially when I was going for the platinum in her eyes, I just, I found myself really noticeably overwhelmed by the sheer volume of skits because you have to see some like very high percentage of them all in order to pop a certain trophy, um, which I was not expecting, but I think the thing that's kind of sad about it for me is I think a lot of games veer towards just more content and more playtime is better, which is ironic because Tales of Arise, I think, is really good at telling a tight story that is overall shorter than a lot of the other Tales games, um, but they kind of go in the exact opposite direction of the skits, and I feel like sometimes it is the case for the sake of tight storytelling that less is more, because I still find myself like in this replay of Arise, like every you know, five to seven skits, there'll be one where I do like stop and perk up and think to myself, oh, this is like, this is really interesting and, and challenging and something different than what I got from the main story. Like all, all of the best things that you feel about skits in basically any Tales game, right? But I feel like because of just, as you say, the pacing and then the overall volume of the skits, it feels much more like you're sifting through a haystack looking for a, for a needle than it sometimes does in, in some of the other games. The people of Southgand originally worshipped Amanuj, the Empyrean of Water. 
the lives of the people of the Southern Isles are inherently tied to... Yeah, that was part of why I was wondering too, Grail, because I feel like in some ways Berseria also does skip-based storytelling like we've been talking about, but for whatever reason, I don't, I don't get that same level of just intuitive disengagement from the skits here than I do with the rise. But one small village deep in South Gand is a special case. The village is called Haria. And even now they keep their faith in Amenoch. They Amenoch. even with the Abbey. I'm grateful that they fight off the demons. I really am. But do they have to dictate which gods we worship to? They think yes. They do. It's their That's their whole thing. Then again, they can't control what's in your heart, can they? But they'll damn well try. Wrestling with the nature of your heart. Damn. Is this town really just the Destiny Islands from other game? Anything worth buying at the store here? I feel like we haven't really been using any gels. Ah, we can top off on life bottles at least. It's never a bad idea. And listen, when we don't have any peach gels, I can't not buy any peach gels. What do you take me for? Some kind of Tails neophyte? Alright, that's good enough. Hey, this doll? It looks like Bienfu. Ah, oh, it does. A keen eye you have, young man. That is a doll of the Empyrean Amenoch. That's Empyrean Amenoch? Yep, no doubt about it. I've seen her with my own eyes. Real dignified, but not without a bit of a temper. You saw her? Why was she angry? Well, the Abbey's banned any profession of the Amenochian faith in Southgand, despite her popularity. Gotta assume that's what got her all bent out of shape. I tried talking <laughs> to her, but no matter what I said, she was just like... They're all slightly different, yet amount to the same thing, Pottery. <laughs> Yeah, more or less. Ha! Fortune smiles upon thee, weary adventurers. That listless goddess is none other than Grim. Oh! Or isn't human? When did I ever say she was? So, <laughs> Got shopkeep, him. where'd you see her? I think it was down by McClear Beach. Pensively watching the tide come in? That's her, all right. Quickly, to the beach! Ugh. <laughs> Why didn't you mention Grimoire as a moloch before now? You can't be too careful with that information. Spies, spies listening everywhere. <laughs> it was fun to remember gold gels in Tales of Arise. I had forgotten that was a thing. Can we just stay and hang out with our penguin friends? Let's call this the end of the game. They lived happily ever after hanging out with the penguins in the Destiny Islands. She's waving at them. That's cute. I love that. <laughs> I love that for you, Mogula. She doesn't know how to be authentic and unfiltered with other people, but at least she can be herself around the penguins. Yeah, I've noticed that. It was funny to kind of experience in real time on the stream grail because I was throwing out gels like a madman when we were doing Symphonia and Dawn of the New World. And then with Zysteria and Berseria, I think I could probably count the number of gels I used on one hand, more or less. It's just a different design philosophy, right? Because there are a lot of different pat, um, battle techniques, some of which are conducive to healing in, uh, in the more recent games. Beautiful waters. So this is Muckler Beach. I hope she's actually here. On to battle. Oh, that's right. So now I have to retrain myself to only use the, um, the burst attack or whatever it's called. Uh, and there's a spell coming out. You really do have a peculiar air about you. 
Yeah, I don't think you're a woman. <laughs> Very different to be pivoting into the role of a caster and not have to run right up to enemies to deal with them. Oh, we get a tutorial. Excellent. Break soul. Yes, that's what it's called. Oh, I'm glad to get the tutorial. That's not how I thought it worked. I thought it just literally absorbed a spell that was coming at you after it was cast. So it's so it's basically the same thing as Renwell's um, ability. It like cancels spells that are actively being cast. Fantastic! That's awesome. I can get behind that. It's a good question why they waited, Grail. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Maybe it's part of the capricious nature of the world. They want you to suffer and feel lost before they actually explain to you how to navigate things. Boy, it is really satisfying to be able to cancel those, though. Feels a little bit like easy mode right now, being able to just turn off enemy spells. Makes me wish I'd tried out Magulu a little sooner. <laughs> that is such a specific simile, Grail. <laughs> Dare I ask where you got that from? <laughs> You get major creativity points then, my friend. Maybe it was from Lafayette's commentary about not being able to understand a box just because you live inside it. That seems pretty similar. I hope I did a good job. It's such a silly mystic card. I love it too. I think I mentioned last time, it's probably the second funniest to me that I've encountered recently after Dex's from Dawn of the New World, which is just top-notch comedy. Alice! <laughs> Cry deeply! Oh, I see what you guys are saying about the Mystic Art comparison. That took me a second. <laughs> yes, I, I feel like that's something where you really have to want to see it, but then once you see it, you can't unsee it. So thank you for <laughs> shattering that uh, that window for me. Is a Moloch like Bienvu, right? To be honest, I don't see how someone so different can be a Moloch just the same as Lafayette at Horizon. I understand your doubts. It's quite the tangly mess. I'll tell you anything. In that case, I've been wondering, what's underneath your hat? Oh no! Anything but that! Secrets! So Lots of secrets. Already. But that ribbon flaps around and gets in the way, right? Could I take it off for you? No! No! That's not possible! You mustn't revolt! The ribbon is the source of all my power! That's another thing I can't say! It's all pants with you. Alright. Is there 
Lila wants to know your location. I could talk about what type of Malakim we are, or our position in the world of Malakim, or our abilities. Oh, I'd like to know all that. Then I will tell you. Listen closely. We Norman are a well-established race of Malakim. Compared to other Malakim, we aren't as adept at manipulating natural forces, but we excel at drawing out and heightening the abilities of others. Think of them as a convenient power-up. They're also known as common spirits. Don't even say that! We Norman hate being called that. Why is it so painful for you? Because it makes people think we're average and unremarkable. That's why we work so hard to show how we're all different. That does explain your quirky speaking mannerisms. Don't sweat it. That's a perfectly common thing to worry about. <laughs> mean. Don't say that. See, I know we've been giving Bienfu a lot of crap, but I feel like the poor guy is batting at a bit of a disadvantage because, you know, you think of someone like Mew, right? And... Yeah, Luke gives him a lot of shit, especially early on, but at least, like, the other members of the party are more understanding and kind of on his side and willing to treat him as <laughs> as someone on a par with them. Whereas here, it's like, <laughs> whom does poor Bienfu have to turn to? Magi Lu on the rare moments when she's not, like, severely abusing him, I guess. Yeah, so good question, Grail. Where does he sit on the tiers? I feel like, like I said, I feel like it's a it's a come from come from behind vibe for me, where he definitely isn't set out to be top tier, but I feel like that gives him a sort of underdog vibe, where I at least am trying to go out of my way to root for him this time around. <laughs> Let's try to give Bianfu a redemption arc. That can be the deep lore of the Tales of Praxis Berseria stream. <laughs> Yay! Three losses. <laughs> Par for the course. Scout ship setting sail. Yeah, I feel that pottery. I feel like a lot of the sillier characters in the Tales Corpus are able to pull that off. Like either there's a sense in which they're actually enjoyable, or they're just so out there that what it's something that wraps around and you can enjoy. Probably. Keeping their eggs warm? Most likely. They look like a mama and a papa. Penguins are monogamous, faithful creatures. They never leave their mate. <sighs> Isn't that romantic? So they lay eggs because they're like husband and wife. But... How do they make... Hoodle is god tier and I would die for him. I'll say it. You want me to say it? I'll say it. <laughs> Hoodle's the best. <laughs> You're right, Bienfu does not compare to someone like like Hoodle. Yep. They have the texture of caviar and the rich flavor of sea urchins. Interesting. So they're more like fish than birds. So you've eaten them. How cruel. Look how much they care about their young. While it may be a bit cruel, they taste amazing. They're considered a delicacy in some circles. Top a bowl of rice with these crunchy eggs and some rich pangan thigh meat, and you get a dish called Family Fricassee. That's a horrific name. I wasn't the one who named it, okay? Those eggs look tasty, but I think I'll pass. It's true pottery, I said it last time, but to not only be so cute and so expressive, but then also to be the first party member to really stand up against Volron, and then also to have such a touching and heartwarming, like unexpectedly meaningful arc with like collecting and befriending all of the other owls. Like try to tell me one way in which Hoodle falls short. I dare you. I double dog dare you. You will not succeed. Good try caster. Not today. Not making me more excited to finally get to Zillia Pottery. <laughs> but you are making me curious. 
Grail, you say that as if there's any other kind of tier list. I was thinking it might be fun, maybe, when Tales of Praxis is all said and done to do a kind of, not even a tier list, but just a bracket of like randomly pitting one game up against each other. Not really to say this one's better than the other, but just as the opportunity to kind of do comparative analyses between them through a sort of different lens. So I don't know if I'll end up doing that, but I figure it, it might be a fun way to have some follow-on content. Hey, I, I played through and spent more hours than I would care to admit thinking about and studying and theorizing about Xenoblade Chronicles in spite of all the knock on it, so I, uh, I definitely feel you on enjoying a game in spite of the mascot pottery. <laughs> now, feeling what you're saying about the combat system being much less fun once you get down to one soul also. <laughs> I have a bad sixth sense for realizing once that's happened and then suddenly just the combat becomes much less fun and possible and I look down and I'm like, oh, that's why. Yeah, Grail, exactly that. <laughs> That's the deep lore of Tales of Praxis. It's just a front for abyss propaganda. <laughs> Obviously. It must be hard to be a streamer who actually, you know, runs on and tries to bring people in based on, like, vapid entertainment or, like, stream-worthy personality. I feel like, see, I feel like I'm punching up because I'm really just trying to run a book club with some like-minded thinkers and gamers, which is a, uh, a much more manageable hurdle for me and something that is much more rewarding. It's hard for me in my head to think about how to manage a boss playing as Mogula. I think I had coded her more as just spellcaster management. Yeah, that tracks. Ah, back to Eleanor. All right. Someone I've actually figured out how to play as. Don't mind if I do. I think you're right about that, Potter. Oh, interesting, Pink Moon Echo. How so? Just in terms of their uh, like their moral convictions, or um, what dimension of similarity are you thinking about? <laughs> At least Eleanor has a full roster of souls. I can move with that. Yeah, 
that was tougher than I would have liked. <laughs> Wait, so Grail, are you are you saying that Eleanor is inferior or superior? Because I don't I don't think we're all quite tracking what it is you're trying to say. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Similar combat styles too, Pikmin Echo. Yeah, I hadn't quite noticed that. So she's the same sort of Moloch as Bianfu? You're Grimoire, right? <sighs> We've been looking for you. We need your help. Big Hat Logan <sighs> wants to know your location. Who are you? I'm Velvet. I know your witch friend. Oh. Grim, so wonderful to see you. It's been forever! Ah, you two. Still as outlandish a pair as ever, I see. How exactly do you know her? Witch training? She was an upperclassman. And? We found this fascinating ancient tome, and we were hoping you could read it for us. Goodness, Magilu. You of all people joining a team? I didn't know you had it in you. Uh, that keep me entertained. Well, I don't need entertainment. Bien! Come on, Grim! Isn't there any way you can help us? It's not the kind of thing I do. Oh, what a shame. Things happen. Well, we tried, didn't we? Maybe you need some incentivizing do it <laughs> i'm begging you i bet you are make my day <laughs> your eyes tell me you're dangerous trouble follows you like a hawk tails a rabbit and at my age trouble is something i'd rather avoid how old are you Ask me again, and you'll get a firework in the tush. Uh, my apologies. It appears we've wasted our time. A walk on the beach is never wasted, but sorry. <laughs> well, how did you learn to read the ancient tongue? Are there books for studying it or something? My, my. Are you actually thinking of learning it on your own? Well, I love reading, and I want to learn more about history. Besides, we need what's in this book. Could he be any purer if he tried? You have passion, child. I'll give you that. Not to mention you want to be helpful to Velvet, don't you, kid? Yeah. <laughs> oh. My tuition isn't cheap, you know. You will teach me? No, I won't. But I admire your dedication enough to read it for you. Now where's this book? <laughs> yeah, but other than that small distinction, Grail. Totally the Here same. Is, <laughs> you needn't be so formal. It's sad how much I feel that. Of ancient Averost. <laughs> Had to be the hard one, of course. A lot of wear and tear, too. This'll take some time. We're in a hurry. That may well be, but this isn't the place for study. Let's move to someplace more comfortable. Hmm, you've redeemed yourself, young man. There's a village called Haria just a little ways away. That works. Thank you. Fine, Haria Village. Whatever gets the job done. Haria, isn't that the village with that demon that Oscar and Teresa were talking about? I think it might be. We should remain on our guard. I love the way Magulu does a little dance when uh, when she just stops and hangs out. Yeah, I think um on. On Pink Moon Echo's point about Eleanor and Saray, it's also interesting because, like, 
I was thinking, yeah, you know, they both seem to be aligned in terms of like the virtues of purification, but they seem kind of different in terms of how Eleanor is trying to kind of cope and get a sort of revenge for her loss, like we were talking about before, and therefore is kind of more closely aligned with Velvet, whereas Saray more just like positively chooses the mission of the shepherd as something he recognizes as an intrinsic good. So that was my first impulse, but I think there is like a further interesting question to ask comparing them with one another, Pink Moon Echo, or it's like, um, like I mentioned on a previous stream, my buddy and, uh, and I'm trying to think of a synonym for colleague for poor Grail's sense, but the uh, other main contributor to With a Terrible Fate, Dan Hughes, he recently played through Tales of Zestiria, and he made the observation that I hadn't really um, made as prominent a part of my playthrough, where he said, yeah, you know, there's this interesting sense in which Saray, like, he pursues the uh, goal of being the shepherd because he's read about that in the Earthen Historia, and so he has this, like, storybook understanding of what it is to be that kind of hero. And so he sets out to enact that and ultimately has to figure out how to have his own journey and be his own kind of hero. So that's one way of reading his arc. Um, so it's interesting to think how even, even if Saray is antecedently coded as more of a pure hero than someone like Eleanor, who has maybe a superficially similar moral compass, but fits much more in with Velvet and her ilk than Saray would, Maybe they both had some kind of similar or at least consonant um, misunderstandings of the roles that they were taking on when they first accepted those roles versus what they grew into over the course of their arcs. I apologize if I'm being rude, but I have to ask. You're not Amanoj the Imperium. I mean, Grail, that's par for the course for you at this point, though, to be fair. So <laughs> it's on you for expecting anything else. Was selling Amanoch figurines that looked just like you. Oh, that. I distinctly remember whispering to the shopkeeper in his sleep, telling him not to sell those things. You showing up in his dreams probably only convinced him you were the real deal. You should sue for his use of your likeness and get proper compensation from that shopkeeper. <laughs> Forget it. It's no concern. Yeah, you're right. It's not like they'd ever sell anyway. Oh, you think a figurine of mine wouldn't sell? You got this whole somber all we think going on. <laughs> I too have this whole somber on we thing going on. You into a product. Me? Really? Oh yes. I'll have you stuffed and mounted. But since it'd be a unique piece, I'd have to price it a bit higher. M mounted? No, no, count me out! Oh. You're no fun. Now, what was it we were talking about? Whether or not you are the Empyrean Amenoch. Ah, yes, that's right. I'm no Empyrean. I'm just a simple girl. <sighs> it would be hard for anyone to worship an Empyrean like me, right? That's true. <clears throat> oh, uh, I mean, it... Just seems like you're the type who can see through anything, so perhaps an Empyrean seems less intimidating from a certain point of view. You're saying I'm scarier than an Empyrean? Not scarier exactly, just more of a savvy sort of woman. That's not a bad answer, but it won't get you out of the doghouse. <laughs> There's no good answer in that situation, Eleanor. Ah, uh, poor Grail. Yes, probably sounds like it's a worthy time to step away and take a break. God knows I've been there. You've seen me be there on the stream, so <laughs> sometimes it's better to cut your losses and just reset. Man, I still to this day remember some of my uh, struggles in Miyazaki's games where there were boss fights in which I properly had to just uh, like walk away from my game console and take an angry walk before I could go back to it because I was just so overwhelmed with frustration at the inability to overcome a boss. I don't really know if I want to fight a Code Red Demon as Mogulu, if I'm being honest. Maybe we'll call an audible for the fight and then go back to trying her out. 
Uh, let's try this. I'm in this 100%. Yeah, the, um, is it the Duke's Ocelot? Is that the name of the kind of dragonoid creature in the, um, in the Crystal Garden in Dark Souls 3? That's one where, like, the first time through it didn't give me that much trouble, and then in my most recent replay of Dark Souls 3, it was like, oh my god, I, I, I had to leave and literally walk away and just clear my head <laughs> before I went back to it. Yeah, that's right, Pottery. Good memory. That and um, all of the bosses in the Scholar of the First Sin DLCs of Dark Souls 2, of course. Dan and I gave a lecture on Miyazaki's games once, and we literally had a whole section talking about how the Ivory King is the perfect, like, case study for, like, the theming of Dark Souls 2, because the game is deeply unfair and just punishes the player in a way that Dark Souls the first does not, and, um... If you haven't played it or haven't played it recently, the Ivory King has this wonderful attack where he will skewer you with his sword and burn away all of your health. But even if you are like on the other side of the map, basically, the game makes it very easy for your character to basically glitch into his sword and get skewered by the attack. So it's like you're, you're constantly being punished through no fault of your own just because of the pernicious structure of the universe. Gotta love bosses like that. Yeah, Pottery, I think I already made this comparison with you in terms of the definitive edition of Tales of Vesperia, but I really feel the same way, I think, the more I'm thinking about it between that and Scholar of the First Sin, where I think the DLC and, and added content kind of fills in a lot of the thematic gaps in the story of the base game in a way that really kind of empowers you to get a lot more out of it, so definitely get it on your being worn out, but... I would echo your sentiment in terms of it being definitely worth it to take the time to go back to it at some point. Especially with the uh, the whole additional ending that they added as a result of that. I think that really helps to make a different layer of meaning out of it. <laughs> yeah, as advertised, Pottery. No, but I respect that. I. Uh, I'm looking forward to publishing on this period because, as I said, I definitely got way more out of it this time around than I did years ago when I played it for the first time. Yeah, I can see why you'd be annoyed by this one, Grail. A little more irksome than some of the other ones have been. Yeah, so it's a good note in the chat to bring up. Um, it's still an open question, which one will stream next as part of Tales of Praxis, but Graces does appear to be the front runner after the last stream, so which I have no problem with. I have so much love for Graces and a burning desire to revisit it after too many years away. But if there are other ones we want to put in consideration, we uh, have time yet to make that decision, obviously.
Oh, Pottery, I missed your message. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed the Symphonia piece. Thank you so much for taking the time to read it. Yeah, I, I never expect that, but I always hope that especially for those who love the games I, I write about so much, they can provide some new insights and value to those people, so I'm, I'm really glad that, that you found that. Oh yeah, I'm really glad you like those parts, Pottery. Yeah, it's funny, I, um, it was one of those things where I got so much out of thinking about Regal especially and his role in the game and everything else, but I think a big part of it um, in terms of what I'll take away and apply to thinking about other games and the other Tales games was that part about kind of how different characters mediate your perspective on the other characters uh, and so how like especially in a new game plus structure like the Tales games the order in which you focus on characters can make a big difference in how you see them so yeah I'm, I'm really glad that you uh, that you appreciated that too and yeah talk about like a great contrast case for skits from what we were talking about with the rise right like oh man that skit after uh, after the gang kills Varley like I think it says so much without beating the player over the head with it that not only is the skit called the end of the revenge, but that it's not even introduced into the main story. It's it's a purely side conversation. Like, oh, that game does so many cool little flourishes with its structure and gameplay and everything like that. Um, it was nice just to take the time to to think about the structure of that and analyze it. Yeah, all right, gang, so we can think about Zillia and Abyss, too, noted. I'll, uh, I'll keep track of that as we go forward. Yeah. Abyss would be a fun one to play as well, because if and when we go through that on the stream, I can also kind of walk through sort of the analysis of it that I did through the lens of Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism as we play through the game, so that can also give us sort of a real-time book club style um, different lens to think about a lot of the events so. but that's the good thing about the tail series we can't really go wrong no matter what we choose and that's interesting I don't think I clocked that we don't get experience or gold for these code red fights I wonder what that means Yeah, and obviously I hope it goes without saying Pottery and Grail and, and uh, others who may have read my most recent work, but uh, you know, if you have any questions about the stuff that I publish on or if you want to chat about any of it in further detail, I am always more than happy to chat about um, all of my work and you know, the stream is a, is a cool opportunity to have those kinds of chats too. Man, after that first conversation, getting into some more Rokuro content from one of the first Code Red Demons that we fought, I'm just eager to get more of that, and we haven't really yet. But I'm hoping, especially based on what Grail said, that we'll have some worthwhile payoff if we uh, keep taking the time to do them. Oh no, Grail, don't say that. You break my heart. I know it's a lot, but my hope is always with that stuff that you know, I, I try my best at least to make it accessible. Especially because, I mean, I'll be honest, if it helps, that article especially was intimidating to me as well. I think that's why, like I said this at the time when I published it, I think a big part of why I started the Tales of Praxis series was just to force myself to write about Tales of the Abyss because I was so intimidated to take it up for so long. And I am by no means like a religious studies scholar or an expert on Jewish mysticism or anything like that. So I really, I took it upon myself to learn and study that stuff and, you know, talk with some of my friends who are more experts in that subject matter just for that article. So, you know, if I can, if there's any way I can make it less intimidating, let me know. And if you have any particular, you know, questions or things you want to work through, or maybe that's easier to do on a stream of Tales of the Abyss. Um, because working through it really did give me like a very different appreciation for the game and also just like 
very truly an idea and appreciation for what it can mean to play a video game and especially a JRPG as a kind of like real spiritual practice like meditation or something like that so I think it's um it's a it's a really cool way to think about why we love these games so much and a lot of the real world value we can get out of them so I'm uh, I'm always happy to chat about any of that stuff Yeah, well, you know I relate to the lack of free time struggle. That's an all too real thing. Man, okay, I'm gonna try switching back to Mogiwa, especially now that we have all of these casters to contend with. Because it is very annoying to have all of these spells coming and no agency to fix them. Oh, or Eleanor can just die in the line of duty. That can also happen. Yeah, Pottery, like I said, your uh, your commentary about the relationship between Abyss and Vesperia definitely stayed with me, so I'm definitely going to keep thinking about it, and I think, you know, if and when we get to Vesperia and Abyss on stream, it'll definitely be cool to think about them in that context. Um, I'll say one thing that we didn't chat about on the stream last time when you mentioned it, but as I was thinking more about it, it came to mind, because I actually I had this thought when I was playing Vesperia, and then I just forgot about it was this idea that um, I think another really cool way in terms of how the themes are unified in the two games is how in both cases you have, I think, these really cool and mature and I would say fairly realistic pictures of how, you know, yeah, you get this JRPG party that comes together and decides to change the world in a certain way, but it's actually really important to them to get consent of all the major, like, kingdoms and players on the world stage before they do that like in tales of the abyss you have that great conference at doth between the two kingdoms um and the the dothic like religious state and then in vesperia you similarly you know bring together all of the leading powers in the world uh, so that they can get mind share about what to do with the blastia uh, at the end of the day as the game is coming to a close and i think that's a really cool thing that um definitely gives me the same feelings as a as a player and audience member across those two games yeah i was lacking the um the blast gauge to do it in that last fight grail that was my issue take a look at this well well now here's a fine haul Yeah, really cool scene, Grail. And it's funny because in um, in the synopsis, which you'll recall is Luke's diary, he says something like, "Yeah, you know, I'm I'm pretty sure it was a bluff, and Guy was just trying to make a point and you know elicit a conversation about this." Uh, but it never read to me in the game itself. Like Guy always struck me as very sincere in what he intended to do, which then was just to me in the way that I read it another cool moment of kind of contrast and dissonance between like the event as it's seen through the eyes of someone like Luke speaking of how the perspective of characters can color our experience of the narrative versus how we see it from the perspective of guy or you know from sort of the third party perspective of of players just looking on in the scene all right pottery well you're definitely uh given me an itch or at least an inkling as to why it would be valuable to uh to play abyss and vesperia back to back i will keep that in mind i'm sure it'll come back to you now that you've uh, mentioned it just shout it out once uh, once it does assault, demons are attacking villages and more people are growing upset with the abbey so i hadn't expected things in hario village to be so laid back they might be on their best behavior because you're accompanied by an exorcist. That's the wrong you're. Oh, you could see the world uh. just black and white. The Abbey wouldn't entrust my responsibility. Who does the subtitles for these games? I don't, this is not worth pausing for, but since I saw that, I'm going to go on a 2-second rant about it. I I I love so much that we get all of these thoughtful and professionally published localizations of these games because I never would have discovered tales otherwise. It's great that so many of them come to the US. 
I know it's sad we don't have them all, but it's so nice to have as many as they do. So thank you, Namco, and thank you, Bandai Namco, for that. But, oh my god, like, whom did they pay to do the localization of Tales of Arise? Because I swear to god, every other sentence is like spelling errors or disconnected with the script as it's read by the people who are doing the dub. It's just, it's total nonsense in a way that goes beyond like any of the other issues that you get in any of the other games. And when you combine that with how desynced like the lip movements are from the voices, it's like, I love that game so much. I, there's a reason I front loaded all of my talk about it and the speed through with all the things that I really appreciate for it. But talk about pet peeves that make Aaron lose his mind. That's a big one. On the surface, I have seen many things in my work. I've beheld both the light and the darkness in the world of men. Hmm. Despite that, no, because of that, I won't turn away from the wrongs that I encounter. Moreover, I have faith. I believe there is good in all our souls. The darkness, huh? Yes, like you. You're awfully direct. No, for sure. And I, I know enough about the industry and have enough colleagues there to understand how much of an impossible task it is. So I get it. But like I said, I think for me, it's just the, the point of contrast between that and then their average level of execution in the other games, which I feel like is categorically better. Um, and then also, like, you know, I know we're doing a, a Tales study series as opposed to Final Fantasy, but you also know that the reason that I'm replaying Tales of Arise is to do a comparative analysis between it and Final Fantasy 16, so that's on my mind, and it's it's kind of hard, I would say, not to compare those two games. And, you know, I don't know what the the real life JRPG party's consensus on Square Enix is. Maybe you love them, maybe you hate them, but I think it's hard to argue the point that they, you know, did a, a fantastic job when it came to localization in 16. Like there's so much care in the translation and the, the lip syncing and everything like that. So it's just, it's, it's hard for me to let that go in a rise. And I just, for all of the other cool and like much more substantive things that I love about the game, it's just like, I wish that level of technical execution were a bit more on point because I think that would make me like much better at buying into the rest of it. It's one of those things where I recognize I am much more anal about like that aspect of storytelling and like the way the language is expressed than most people are. And I wish I could let that go about myself, but I'm also old enough and set in my ways enough to recognize that that is not going to change for me at this point. Yes, Pink Moon Neko, thank you for getting us back to the substance of this. I think that was warranted. Um, and I, I definitely do see Eleanor um, channeling Saray, and that's, good. that's a really good point of comparison. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, Pottery, you are you are playing like one of the mothers of all memes about localization. So, <laughs> I uh, I envy you the the opportunity to experience that afresh. <laughs> yes, yeah, such greatest hits as Let's Mosey. Um, Tifa saying, don't be, I don't, I don't, I don't want to risk saying the R word on the stream, but, uh, Tifa saying a word that she, uh, definitely did not say in remake, uh, and, and will not be saying in rebirth. Yeah. You get a lot of adventures and localization in that game. No doubt about that. that exclamation point underneath or maybe it's in that no it can't go in the house must be underneath the dock <laughs> yep 
Yep. That's a good one, too. <laughs> so many. Dilly dally shilly shally. That got some more miles out of it. Um, not in Remake, but oh, in Crisis Core. That was a, a, a motif in Crisis Core as well. The 90s were a magical time, an ambitious time. I think part of it, I, I don't know if game historians would agree with me on this front, but I read at least part of it as, um, you know, in the 90s, everyone was still like, like there was less of a formula around things like localization or even just game design norms between studios and publishers. Um, and so I, I think that's a big part of why I like going back to what are now more retro games from that era. Like even Tales of Destiny, I felt that way about um, because it is like you just get more variation and like things you're totally not prepared for or wouldn't expect in the way where, you know, nowadays games are either uh, operating in accordance with or like rebelling against a formula of one kind or another. So like I said, I don't know if that's the game historian consensus, but that's what it feels like to me as someone who's reading these games. It definitely did, Grail. Yeah, we were uh, we were talking about that a few streams ago. But like, it had plenty of localization weirdness, as so many games of that era did. But also pure poetry, like the um, the soliloquy that I read last time. So. We could use a place to stay. Any rooms Say open? Say they did a pretty yep. damn good job with that Just one, all things planning, considered. You can help yourself to that room there. All right, time to start deciphering this scroll. Come on, you be fair. You know what a carol is. It's it's a it's a pun on Carol because he's a he's a bard, a musician. So I I know what you mean, but also there was a, a a method to the madness. Let's wait somewhere outside so Grim can concentrate. Um, do you think maybe I could stay and watch? I really do want to study the ancient tongue. I promise I'll be quiet and not get in your way, teacher. Yeah, pottery for your benefit before we move on here. Um, you might already be familiar with this, but I've I've never read any of these, but I think there's a I think it's a book series called Legends of Localization, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a lot of interesting stories behind like the localization of well-known games. I, I oftentimes see them on the convention floors at um, PAX and other cons like that. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in that kind of thing, that's a cool dose of game history as I understand it. What did you just say, child? Uh, that I'd be quiet and... No, what did you call me? Teacher, you said you didn't want to be called ma'am, so I thought maybe that'd work. Yes, satisfactory. Right. <laughs> yeah, fair Did enough, Grail. I know what you mean. Thank you so much, no, I get teacher. that, though. Like, sometimes it's fun and interesting. Sometimes I, too, would rather not know how the sausage gets made. It kind of depends on the particular details and uh, what you're in the mood for, I think. Listen, I don't know what they told you in Isolt, but our village has its own traditions. This village is under the divine protection of the Empyrean Amenoch. For unbroken centuries, a line of his priestesses have guided us. They're tasked with performing the sacred rites of worship. And sometimes, they even deliver us his words and will. And there's still a priestess today? Of course! And her daughter is training to become our next priestess. Although, I sometimes feel they push themselves too hard. Both mother and daughter are giving their all for Haria. But the Abbey doesn't care about any of that. And they stole our temple from us. By force? 
An exorcist named Teresa came and heard us out. But from the very beginning, she always intended on taking our temple. Her words may have been kind, but that doesn't change the fact that she demanded that we worship her god, Enomenat. In all the years we've worshipped Amenoch, not once did we ever try to force others to adopt our beliefs. Why haven't I seen this priest as she's talking about? Oh, that's cool, Grail. What's serious? While we're here, it occurs to me this is also like an interesting... I don't know if it's too call if it's too strong to call it a motif, but at least something that comes up in multiple games, which wouldn't be on my mind except... I just played through this part in Arise. Um, the idea of these little villages that are kind of quietly resisting the flow and order of the world, whether it's somewhere like here that is trying to retain its own traditions and mode of worship, even in the face of the Abbey and Anominat, or like in Tales of Arise, you also get, um, I forget the name of the village, but in the, the last of the fifth kingdom, uh, excuse me, the last of the five kingdoms on Dana, the village of Danans who have like escaped and are in hiding from their Renan subjugators. And it's interesting to me to um, like think about the role that plays in this kind of Tales game because oftentimes, like here and also in Arise, you don't discover them until like a fairly well developed point in the story where the party has already banded together and resolved to try to change the world in one way or another. And so then it raises an interesting question to ask, okay, if you think about different modes of resistance or living outside of the existing world order, like what is the difference between what it is that the party is trying to do and what it is that the people who have kind of turtled in this town away from their oppressors are doing and given that difference, what is it that the party learns by going into this town and, you know, experiencing their perspective on life in the world? I think that's a cool thing to think about. Oh, interesting, Grail. Yeah, I've never even heard of that one. You'll have to let us know how it is. Yeah, um, I'll be interested in chatting about Volron probably next week, Grail, because I'm, I'm almost certain I'll plow through the rest of Arise over the weekend because I have to to stay on track for this lecture. Um, and I think a lot of his character development happens from, like, Lenigus onward, which is just where I'm getting in the story now. Um, but for what I've experienced from him so far, yeah, I'm really engaged. I remember really liking him a lot. I think he's much more like quietly vile than I remembered. Like without too many spoilers, one thing that was on my mind today and yesterday was I, I had forgotten like the sordid details of his whole kidnapping of Shion and they're not explicit about it, but I think it's like, it's pretty heavily implied that he like pretty horribly mistreats her while he's kidnapped her in ways that for spoilers and also content, I don't really want to get too much into, but I think he's like, he's kind of, even by the standards of like the darkness in the tales games or in a JRPG, there's kind of like a grim reality to his character. That's kind of, that makes it much more unsettling and horrifying for me. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely paying a lot more attention to him this time around, um, given that this time around I know where the story is headed and how things turn out. Uh, so we should definitely follow up on that this coming week as well. Banning local religions. The Abbey sure knows how to oppress the populace. I'd imagine that comes part and parcel with spreading the good word. Other <laughs> yeah, that's another way to go with the, uh, the kidnapping sequence grail in terms of what one imagines. <laughs> that's not what I was imagining this time around. <laughs> Sealing it off would be provocative enough. But straight up taking it over? Not a lot of so-called reason to that. Unless... Do you think they need it for some other purpose? Shrug. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting and challenging thing, Padre, when like 
a particular character evokes a lot of different ideas for you and you're not sure how to square those with the role that they play in the in the story ultimately um maybe we'll have occasion to dig into that in, in Berseria, or if not maybe it's even a reason to think about streaming her eyes next or at some point i think that's a really good case of where the rubber meets the road in terms of um how character analysis can inform our understanding of like the overall arc of a long story like a jrpg so she digs being called teacher well played laffy said she wasn't so fond of ma'am, so I guess he figured he needed an alternative. You can tell how badly he wanted to help her with the languagey work. I think our Moloch boy's finally finding himself. So it would seem. Yeah, I'm trying to be more generous in, in the replays that I'm doing for Tales of Praxis pottery for characters like that who seem at first glance underarticulated because I, I don't know that you were on the stream when I was talking about this part of Vesperia, but you know I think one of the common issues that people have with um, with Vesperia is like feeling as though Duke is similarly kind of underarticulated as a character and not kind of well represented for his ultimate role in the story. And so I tried to go back into Vesperia with a similarly kind of open mind to thinking about that. And I ended up like, obviously, as you know, I'm still thinking about Vesperia a lot for the next thing that I'm writing. Um, but I ended up having a lot more appreciation for him than I did the first time around. And so I'm kind of, I, I get where you're coming from with Volron. Um, and I think oftentimes when other characters are explored in such depth in a JRPG, like the contrast alone between the deep character studies of some characters and the somewhat more superficial ones of others can make it seem like some characters aren't given their due. I don't know if that's always the case though. I feel like sometimes like less characterization is more, almost in a similar way to what we were saying in terms of numeracy versus scarcity of skits in these games. And so I'm, I'm I'm kind of trying to withhold judgment on Volron for the same reason and see where they go with him afresh. Yeah, this is so interesting. I don't, I don't really have the same sort of feeling of rushedness at the end of a, a typical Tales game like, um, like you guys seem to be expressing. I wonder where that comes from. Yeah, I don't know, Grail. I mean, like, I, I recognize that Duke has scenes, but especially in the, like, the base edition, I think playing through the definitive edition also helped with this because there's more of him. But I think in terms of the role he ultimately plays in the story, I think it's fair to be surprised at how sequestered a lot of those scenes and moments are relative to the overall volume of content. That's what I mean. Yeah, I'm excited to dig into that stuff too, Pottery. Oh man, you're getting me geared up about Vesperia. You guys are getting me geared up about all these other games. This is the the uh, the joy and the danger of Tales of Praxis. We uh we open the floodgates and we end up chatting about all the games in the best of ways. I think there's more pottery, isn't there? Um, well, maybe we'll have to talk about it at a different point because I hadn't played the base game that recently. And so I feel like there were some things where maybe I wasn't sure whether they were added or I had forgotten them. But I feel like a lot of the... Um, I had it in my head that some of the sequences pertaining to the the town from the past whose name I'm forgetting now in the desert. I feel like some of those were not in the base game, but that might be my memory playing tricks on me as well. What connection do you think there is between the violent demon Teresa mentioned and this village? Couldn't tell you. Could there have been a demon blight breakout here? This village doesn't look like it's been attacked, but whatever it is, if it keeps the Abbey's eyes off us for once, that's good enough for me. You really will use anything and everything towards your own aims, won't you? Yep, and that includes you. As I'm sure you've noticed. That's my whole thing right now.
One thing I was thinking about with regard to Volron 2, not to make this just a let's talk about Tales of Arise while we're talking about Tales of Berseria stream, but because I, I remember you guys talking about him in this capacity during the last stream, so it was on my mind when I was playing it over the last couple of days. Um, and I think he's one of those characters, like similar to what you were saying, Pottery, about Rapide and Vesperia, where a decent amount of the content that does characterize him is not in places where you would typically think, like mainline cutscenes. Like I noticed, even in the first uh, like sequence of battles with him in the um, the water realm on Dana, like there's a lot of just his dialogue in battle that I think goes a long way towards characterizing him in, in pretty interesting ways in terms of why he's doing what he's doing. Um, but where there aren't really dedicated cutscenes to it, it's just mostly back and forth between him and Alfin. Um, and then I seem to remember there being one particular side quest once you get to Lenigus that also like provides some background detail. But again, stuff that is grounded in side content and stuff that's either easy to miss or easy to kind of downweight in terms of your overall appraisal of the content in the game uh, versus what you would get from, from a villain like Mythos, for example. It sounds like deciphering the text might take some time. We should be prepared to wait it out here a while. Hopefully it'll all be worth it in the end. I hope so too, but ancient Avarost is complex. It's not just a matter of knowing the grammar and vocabulary. Oh? Then how exactly do you read it? I'm not sure about the specifics myself, but from what I understand, you kind of have to intuit a lot of it. A language hmm. based on guesswork? Thanks, old dead people. You're officially the worst. That has a, an interesting, unexpected connection with the, uh, the idea of esoteric interpretation and exegesis, um, which I won't belabor here, but I talk about that a lot in the, the beginning motions of my article on Tales of the Abyss, if you are interested in looking more into that. Yeah, Grail, I, I think I mentioned this before, but I had the same like mind-blowing moment in terms of age when I did Tales of Symphonia remastered for the stream because the fact that at the end of the game, Prisea talks to Alicia's grave about how she's 28 in terms of her like actual age and time is starting to move her again. I was like, oh, fuck man I'm 28 now and I was like I was a kid I was like probably Genesis age when I was playing this game for the first time or younger like what <laughs> talk about a reality check <sighs> oh ancient Avarost you have the obstinacy of a sperm blood oh I know Pottery I was thinking about that too and they kept calling him old man I was like man <laughs> you're just making me feel even older sitting here playing this game <laughs> It does make me feel like I understand better a lot of what Raven is going through. Like when we were giving him so much love during the last stream, I think that's why I think like I've gotten older. And so that is what allows me to relate to him in ways that I couldn't the first time I played it. <laughs> Just make sure you get regular cardiologist checkups so that you don't go the way of Raven in terms of your heart. <laughs> the parent hates tomatoes, the child eggplants. I doubt those have much to do with the Nominat. Yeah. Their grammar is nothing like ours. Sometimes you have to reorder the words, and even then the meaning can require leaps of logic and flashes of intuition. Reordering? So like, San San? Pocho Pocho? Pocho Musan? That's true, Padre. Can you read it that way? Pocho Musan. Now where did you get that from? These words are lined up, like they repeat. And when I read this part that same way, it just felt right. So I'm just, I said I wasn't going to belabor this. I am going to belabor it slightly because I think it's worth it. Like, I forgot how direct a connection this is with the scene, which is cool. So I'll share it here for, you know, people who might be watching and haven't talked with me more directly about it. If they want to check it out, my article on Tales of the Abyss. But literally, if you look at the section on... Um, exegesis which is one of the first ones tales of the abyss as an esoteric text it talks about like where the rubber meets the road in terms of 
interpretation of the Torah and the Hebrew Bible for like Jewish mystic traditions, but it's very much like what, what esoteric and mystical practices in religions amount to is basically the understanding that very roughly there are hidden meanings within texts that are different than the literal meanings or the text as a metaphor, but that reveal deeper cosmic truths about things like the origin of the universe and how to attain like harmony with the divine and things like this. Um, and so like Jewish mystics, uh, over like the years and the different traditions actually articulated like very sophisticated, like different levels of what it is to read a text where like, if you read something like the Bible, there's the literal story of what actually happened. And then there are different symbolic meanings that you could apply to it kind of, you know, similarly to what we do when we're reading something like a tales game on the stream talking about like, Oh, what's the symbolism of Lafayette's compass or something like that. Like, it, yeah, it's literally a compass that points the way for the ship, but what does that mean in terms of the context of the story and what it's trying to teach us? So that's another level. And then kind of the deepest level is like, okay, what is the hidden internal meaning that connects up with the kind of essence of the cosmos? And that's the kind of thing where you need to like actually go through disciplined training with a mystic teacher in order to basically understand exactly like grimoire is saying to Lafay said here, like how to intuit the connections between words and concepts in ways that are not literal, but that kind of unlock different levels of understanding within your mind that wouldn't otherwise be available. So it's, it's really cool, especially after thinking about that until the abyss to see it here in Berseria, because like that kind of, mystic tutelage is very directly what is happening between Grimoire as teacher right now and Lafayette said as student. Hojo Muson. Hmm. If that's repeated here, then the passage turns into the nameless Empyrean. Empyrean? Ho oh, ho, that has to refer to Innominat. I think we're on to something. All right, so if we apply this rule here, then... Hmm, hmm. It would seem to be a book of children's counting songs. It's not about Enominat? What matters is what the song says, child. And I think you will be very interested in the words. I wonder if they've made any progress yet. Shall we go check on them? Yeah, Pottery, I think that's a really touching and interesting reading of Raven. Um, that was one of those things where I, uh, like, I did wish the game went a little bit more into, like, the relationship of how they knew each other during the war. Um, but I think it is interesting to think about, like, Raven clearly has the through line in his character of thinking about what it is to have kind of lived too long and understand like how to carry on for the other people he knew who aren't there anymore, especially when he kind of always feels as though he's living on borrowed time under these somewhat artificial circumstances. And I think even though like his final confrontation conversation with Duke doesn't really echo this as much, I think there is a sense in which, especially as divorced as Duke seems to have become from humanity, Raven is kind of, someone with unique standing to try to call Duke back to that. So the question of why doesn't he make more of an effort to, I think is an interesting one to try to unpack. Take a look at this. I have meat and mushroom spore, tender parts of prickle bore. Yeah, Pottery, that's a, that's a great spot on example of, of exegetical interpretation of like those old texts. That's exactly oh, what I'm talking about. Big. What a treasure! Oh, that's interesting, Grail. I, uh, I might have to go hunting for that manga. That sounds like the kind of thing I'd really enjoy reading. All right. Do you plan on just giving up? Polymedes is Amenoch's temple. The priestess isn't the only one whose job it is to protect that temple. It's the duty of everyone born in this village. 
Why did the Abbey need Amenocha's temple badly enough to risk causing this much unrest? But how will we protect our village from the demons if the Abbey abandons us? Besides, we won't be able to do business with the people of Isolt anymore. Our faith in Amenocha... Yeah, Grail, if that's easy for you, I'd absolutely love that. I'd love to check it out, especially while I'm thinking about Vesperia. Thank you. Demon blight changed everything. Will we never be able to return to the way things were? The way things were. All right, let's see what Luffy and Grimm have learned. Well, any results? Yes, well, thanks to the boy here. As it turns out, he has quite the knack for languages. <laughs> Only because I've got the best teacher. Aww. Careful, honey tongue. You'll give this old girl ideas. Huh? Now, child, I'm sure they're curious about the song we unearthed. Why don't you read it aloud? Yes, teacher. Song is, and I'm going to stop harping on it, but it's it's just interesting because, like, one of the things that got me to start thinking about Tales of the Abyss and exegetical practice within mystic traditions also is like not only are there a lot of you know explicit references to Kabbalah in terms of stuff like the Sephiroth and the names of the towns after particular Sephiroth in the game but also music is such a big part of Tales of the Abyss's universe and song and like musical cadence is also a big part of like Hebrew and the tradition of like actually reading the Torah and also like interpreting the Torah in certain exegetical practices. So the fact that this is a song is just icing on the this cake. Song? Ape headed is the lord of the land with seven mouths to devour malevolence. Through pulses of earth doth base nature's flow as he awaits the time of awakening. Four Empyreans may tear him asunder, but so long as there is one receptive to divine power, Therians shall be forever reborn in sight of the full crimson moon. The nameless Empyrean hath one heart. The nameless Empyrean hath one body. Because it's a song, girl. Therians? Essentially, this ancient text you found is an annotated volume of drawings and songs pertaining to Enominot. Yeah, and they talk, I mean, talking about an eight-headed dragon, right? That's, um, I forget if that's exactly how they refer to it or them, or if it's singular or multiple, but in Zestiria, they also call out, like, eight monstrous dragons of old or something like that. So there's definitely continuity there as well. Annotated? Then hurry up and just tell us what it means. I'm sorry. So far, we've only figured out how to read the song lyrics. All right. I take it we're still in for a good long wait before it's thoroughly decrypted. Likely so. But if we want to find out what the Abbey is up to, we need to know what's in this book, no matter how long it takes. Hmm. What the Abbey's up to, is it? I think we can learn much, even from the lyrics alone. The drawings depict him with eight heads. One of them belongs to his main body, but the other seven are his mouths. Those mouths consume malevolence, sending it along earth pulses back to that main body so he can awaken. The seven monsters fitting that description are called... Therians. Right. Now, as for this malevolence, I have no idea what that means. Hmm. What about the second part? I haven't studied much ancient history, but it said this world was created by four Empyreans. Earth, water, wind, and fire. But they also call Enominat an Empyrean. 
Perhaps a war broke out between Anominot and the other Empyreans that resulted in him being sealed away. But if there is someone to connect with this divine power, the Therians will keep spawning. And just like that, Inominat will be revived. If we assume that Shepard Artorius fits that bill, and that he's trying to reawaken Inominat, everything lines up. Which means our job is to find these Therians and cut off Inominat's heads, so to speak. But where do we even start looking for them? Remember, the song states that the Therians and Inominat's body are connected through Earth pulses. If their job is to feed Inominat, the most effective place to position them would be at the Earth Pulse points. Points? The places where the power of Earth Pulses is concentrated. Like Sephiroth. Places with that sigil. Hey, remember the barrier that was keeping this bug in the forest? Wait, are you trying to say that thing's a Therian? And yet, it would explain why the Abbey was keeping it locked up. And there was that same barrier at the villa, too. That's right. Do you suppose that was also a Therian? Does that mean the Therians all come in different forms? Should we go to Logres and check? We've just started deciphering the book. I'd hate to lose time on some fool's errand. I'd rather know at least a little more about what's in it before we make a move. <laughs> we did it, Grail. We solved it. Everything is just everything else. Something bothering you, Grim? This line. The one about Therians being forever reborn. I just felt the same thing as I did in Warg Forest. The needle's pointing in the direction of Amenoch's temple, Palamedes. Do I recall hearing that the Abbey took that over? Temples and ritual sites are often built on places thought to be rich in spiritual energy. You could probably get more terrible if you really tried, Grail. <laughs> I'm sure if we want to get even memeier with it, it would be easy. All over the world. If there's only seven Therians, most of them will be empty. It's not like we have any better leads. If there's even a chance, shouldn't we go check it out? Better than sitting around waiting on the book. If nothing else, we'll find out what Luffy said is sensing. Hmm. Just a theory, but if you were to kill a Therian... What? Hmm. I guess there's only one way to find out. Never mind. Good luck out there. Probably just the wind. I'm sure it won't come up again. It's, I mean, we're joking about Tales of the Abyss, but I think it's interesting too because the more I've been playing the other games since I played Tales of the Abyss and wrote that study of it, the more I've been noticing that sort of like the the esoteric interpretation of lore as a motif in the other games like we get it really strongly here but especially since we're already losing our minds over Vesperia on the stream um, I have to imagine that whole like storytelling sequence and, and song talking about the origins and invocation invocation of a nominat that should call to mind also the very similarly like structured and represented um like discovery of the lore behind the Adafagos and the like the deep history of Terka Lumere in Tales of Vesperia uh and the whole concept of the Critian race as this similarly kind of you know like keeper of the esoteric true origins of the world where you know even their city of Miorzo can't be discovered unless you, you know, ring a bell and have the right heritage and the lore itself is, you know, like hidden within the city and has to be uncovered and the meaning of it deciphered. Um, so you get that in a range of the games, I think, which is an interesting way of kind of having to excavate the deep history of the world uh, and really only being able to 
know what the history is once you're in the right position to understand it, which I think is a big part of Vesperia and also what we're seeing here. Interesting, too, with that history, one thing that's worth calling out just as we keep track of this world and how it relates to Zestiria, and we spent a lot of time talking on the stream in terms of how we don't have in this prequel a lot of the language and conceptual infrastructure that exists in Zestiria in terms of things like malevolence and the power of purification and the Lord of Calamity and stuff like that. Um, so it's easy to go into a prequel like this and see that and suppose, oh, well, that's something that's going to be innovated later in the world in the history of this cycle of shepherd and malevolence and everything as people come to better understand and define it. But now we understand, oh, actually, no, that like universe of concepts have existed within the world forever. It just got lost to history even more ancient than what we're seeing in Berseria. And now it's starting to get excavated again and reintroduced in the vernacular. So that's interesting to discover at this second act point in the narrative and actively ask ourselves as we go on, like, how does that different understanding of this story's relationship with the broader world context inform how we're thinking about these characters and their journey on how this all informs Tales of Zestiria after that? <laughs> That's right. I mean, look, we're all Tales fans, so we all understand that the opening sequence uh, explains everything we need to know about the game in the coolest way. I will ring a bell until you're with me by my side. That's all you need to know about Vesperia. Pottery, good question. Um, yeah, Grail can fact check me. I think it said that the Therians consume malevolence as opposed to drain. I think that's the language that it used. Definitely some kind of consumption and conversion mechanic. I think something along the lines of, of draining or consuming as opposed to generating. Yeah, I think you're right there. To the Palamedes. Is this the right direction? There wasn't another exit from the town, was there? Oh, there was? Oh, yes, the, uh, the field indicator on the other side of the map. Good call. I knew that didn't feel quite right. Thank you, Grail. What would I do without you? We've established this before. I would just wander around for twice as long before I figured out the next place to go. Who are you? The innkeeper's daughter. I just... I happened to overhear you all talking about going to Palamedes and... Did you report us to the Abbey? Am I gonna have to fucking kill a bitch? Report? But you already have an exorcist with you. If you have any business, talk with her then. I think for what it's worth, Pottery, I th my take is that I had the same reaction as you did, and I think the game wants the player of Zestiria to be kind of thrown off balance by that, because I think it does sound like the opposite of what you would expect, where these Therians are like converting malevolence in order to bring about this new god figure of a Nominat. So I think we're supposed to be kind of consumed and unsettled, uh, excuse me, confused and unsettled by that at this point. That's how I read it, at least. I, I'm Eleanor Hume, an exorcist with the Abbey. How might I be of service? I want you to look for someone. A mother and her child went to visit the Abbey grounds, but they haven't returned. They've both gone missing? Yes. The mother's name is Mahina. She's a priestess of Amanoch. And her little daughter's name is Kamoana. Hold on. If she's a priestess of Amanoch... Right. 
Ever since the Abbey booted her out from the temple, she's been regularly going back to make her objections heard. But one day, she never returned home. And now her daughter has disappeared too. I can only assume that she went to go look for her mother. And you believe they're being held at the temple? Oh no, ma'am. I just... I just can't imagine Mahina would abandon her daughter like that. Kamawana is next in line to succeed her, so she's had a strict upbringing, but her mother truly loves her. Please forgive Mahina for her protests. I was just hoping you could use the Abbey's resources to track them down. I will do everything in my power to find them. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Like Kamoana, I grew up with only my mother as family. I can't help but worry for them. Of course. Let's be off, Miss Exorcist. Wait, so I don't understand, Grail. Are you just... Are you are you joking? Are you trying to say there's a sense in which you see Artorius as an antagonist? I don't quite follow that. Pottery, in terms of your comment, um, yeah, I think I think one thing that it is worth noting and that it's appropriate to keep in mind as a player of Zisteria is that even with the context that we have up to this point, assuming that we're not looking to the later events of Berseria, we have paradigmatic models from Zisteria of what different um, shepherds have been like over the years and we know that not all of them have been pure of heart themselves or doing things that actually helped the world like Azura who was a shepherd who ended up you know, becoming a Hellion himself um, or even Michael before Saray who created Heldolf right and so I think it's worth bearing in mind that even though there is definitely this tension where, you know, we're playing in a game where we're acting against the shepherd, uh, it's also perfectly coherent to suppose that what we're getting a portrait of and a look into is a shepherd who is not doing the same thing that Saray is. So I think it's, uh, it's worth, it's worth keeping that in mind as we think about, you know, what the nature of a nominat is and what it is that Artorius might be trying to do. Like it might, it might change the context of Saray's quest, but I don't think that's to say it intrinsically Ellen, undermines it. What's your game here? The mother and daughter, you mean? That's on me. I'll search for them myself. I don't care about that. Well, what then? Why are you actively helping us decipher the book when we're using it to thwart the Abbey's plans? Do you think I might be deliberately misleading you? Laying a trap of some sort for you all? Are you? I think you're a lot of things, Demon, but Foolish is not one of them. I want to know the truth. I want to know what Lord Artorius is trying to accomplish. And there's something happening in the world right now. I want to know what it is. Unfortunately, little old Eleanor has never been deemed trustworthy enough to be given such information. So, my only option is to find out for myself. Yeah, that's a good you question, Pottery. I don't think we have enough information to weigh in on that one way or another at this point but something tells me either will lead me to the same destination and worth so keeping an eye on any need to lie to us exactly and what'll you do if those truths don't line up cleanly with what you believe I'm not sure yet as honest an answer as any either way it looks like you'll be working with us for the near future yes for now hey could I ask you something? What is it? About the Therians. I've heard you call yourself a Therian before. Is there any particular insight you have about them? No, none. Artorius said I was one, that's all. And that doesn't bother you? Does it bother you? Nope, not at all. If you're not worried, then neither am I. I'm surrounded by freaks. <laughs> but... Was that truly the reason Ceres chose me? Yeah, you know, starting to get more insight into what Velvet's nature might be. I think, you know, I don't, um, 
I don't want to speculate too much on stuff that we'll probably discover in the upcoming hours of this game, but I think with regard to both of your most recent comments, Grail and Pottery, uh, yeah, thank you, Pink Moon Neko. I'll get the skit in a sec. Um, I think it's also worth keeping in mind something that we talked a lot about as one of the main themes in Zysteria, especially near the end game, uh, namely the difference between what it is to be purified or malevolent in terms of having an alignment between what you believe and what it is that you do in the world versus then as a consequence of that after like aligning your actions with your beliefs then doing things that are evil for the world or good for the world right that was a huge part of that with the idea that you know there can be like assassins who are pure of heart uh or you know seemingly good people like cardinals uh, who are malevolent uh, and everything in between, right? And so I think part of what will help us to navigate the question of like who is evil or good in this game versus who is a protagonist or an antagonist because this game is clearly playing with that in ways that I think must be informed by Sisteria is to keep in mind that there's this distinction between what it is that makes someone like malevolent or authentic as an actor or, pu or pure or whatever you want to call it in this world versus then what makes someone like a morally good or morally bad actor in this world. And so I think we should keep both of those levels in mind as we progress through the story and think more about Velvet and Artorias and what it is that they're trying to do in the world and how it is that they're doing it. Which is to say, just to, just to finish that thought in case this wasn't clear, like, you know, if we're, if we're asking, like, what is it that Artorius is trying to achieve and, like, how is it that he's doing it, it might be useful for us as we go on and get more color into that and what it is that Velvet is doing and everyone else in the world, not to say, like, oh, is, is Artorius, like, doing evil for the sake of good or vice versa, um, but to first ask, like, is Artorius doing the things that he believes in for the sake of what he thinks is the right thing to do or not. And then regardless of whether or not he is, because that's, that's what malevolence or purity consists in, right? Are his actions having a positive or negative impact on the world? And how does that relate to the malevolence or purity of his actions and intentions? And on that thought, I have to switch controllers. Thank you so much, PS5. <laughs> if Madame Eleanor is a soaring Pegasus, then Velvet is a wolf in the shadows. If Madame Eleanor is a plate of spaghetti carbonara, Velvet is squid eat noodles with seaweed. That is a really good point, Padre. Yep. All, all that we know right now is that we have we have a very clear understanding of how it works and how it's represented in Zysteria. And now, just as recently as getting that book translated, we know that malevolence as a concept has existed in the deep past of this world prior to Berseria. We don't have any clear, like, direct evidence that I've seen so far to the conclusion that malevolence as it was previously understood has the same functionality or understanding as it did in Zysteria. And so especially since the world is clearly going through like pretty deep foundational changes throughout the events of Berseria, it is worth asking and like looking at the evidence to see, okay, are things really working here in the same way that Zysteria told us they were, or are we in sort of a different phase of the world that then is evolving to make possible the understanding of the concepts uh, and the functionality of the world that we see in Zysteria? So that's a good question to keep track of as well, I think. I don't follow you completely, but I think I get the point. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. The two have nothing at all in common. And since they don't share anything in common, some fighting now and then just can't be helped. Well, they both have beautiful hair. Okay, but we're talking a noble exorcist and an aloof demon. <laughs> Eleanor sometimes treats you coldly. And Velvet has helped me more times than I can count. Madam Eleanor gives herself fully to the salvation of others, but Velvet is bent solely on revenge. 
That means they're both motivated by thoughts of others. How is the cheerful and talkative Madame Eleanor in all this scene? I feel like the skit is a much punchier and more entertaining way of talking about all the things we've been discussing for the last, like, hour and a half on the stream. I'm only telling you what I've experienced. <laughs> Actually, I feel that Madame Eleanor isn't really reaching out to me. It's all right if Eleanor doesn't want to talk to you. I'm here for you, Bienfu. You aren't alone. That just makes me feel lonelier. <laughs> you two are opposites yourselves. Huh? Here's another way in which we could apply those concepts we were talking about on the ground to um, Velvet and Eleanor right now, right? And that's that's not to say that conceptually speaking, malevolence and purity and everything like that uh, are known to be equally applicable in this world as they were in Zestiria. But just if we were to, one toy model of finding our way into Velvet and Eleanor's characters could be to say, well, Velvet, yeah, she, she might seem to be doing things that are destructive within the world, but the scattered bones were also killing people. And Velvet seems to have very clear alignment between her core belief that revenge is the only valuable thing for her in the world and what it is that she's actually trying to achieve. Now, one interesting way to then like model her progress in the narrative off of that might be to say, well, if she's still on this revenge quest, but she's starting to get attachment to these other characters like investment and Lafayette set, then maybe the way she's proceeding is actually making her more prone to malevolence because she's still continuing on the same revenge quest, but her underlying beliefs are actually changing so that what she believes doesn't as naturally and directly cohere with the revenge quest that she's still following on, right? Whereas Eleanor, like, granted, we still don't totally understand the, uh, like, the purpose of the Abbey and what it is they're trying to do, but if we think that they at least posture themselves as this kind of righteous organization and we know that Eleanor is just in it basically for revenge because she saw her whole family and community destroyed by demons we might think that that's the kind of setup where there's an internal tension between her beliefs and what it is she's trying to achieve versus the means she's taking to achieve it which is much more directly conducive to malevolence as understood and presented in Zestiria. Yeah, I'm with you on the first half of that message, Grail. I haven't seen the second half yet, but um, I think th this this is kind of the fun part of the second act, and this is why I'm glad we've spent so much time thinking about second acts explicitly, because I think this is where the game starts to get really interesting, where if you are actively reading it and thinking about, well, how are its characters in dialogue, not only with its themes, but also with the themes of the game that preceded it, we start to get a lot of these interesting points of comparison and contrast that make us want to probe deeper and kind of trip us up in our conceptual analysis because things are getting more complicated in the world and we're also getting more of those points of connection between it and the previous game. Oh god, I'll say I've been having fun playing as other characters, but it does feel a bit of a, brush, of a breath of fresh air to go back to Velvet after all of that. They sure were. I think I'm just gonna take a break from the other characters and play as Velvet for a few fights here. A nice cleansing experience. Yeah, definitely interesting in that dimension, Potter. I think that's interesting too, where um, on the assumption that like the typical JRPG, Velvet will eventually reach a point where she's more self-reflective and, and thinking about the changes she's overcome. It will be interesting to keep your comment in mind in terms of how much like 
how much her beliefs and guiding intentions changed without her even realizing it before she reached that point of reflecting on it. Because I do think that's something that speaks a lot to her character and her particular journey in this context of the prequel to Zysteria in a way that you don't get in uh, in your average JRPG, because it's not the kind of story it's often trying to tell. Take a look at this. Yeah, I'm excited um, for a lot of reasons to get to Zillia and its sequel, Grail, but uh, not least of all to be able to finally talk about them with you, because I know you have such deep exposure to those games. And I, I, I would say also, like as someone who also has more appreciation for Dawn of the New World now, that strikes me as a fair assessment of it. I'll say like, there's more than one reason why I focused on reading it through the lens of Regal in my analysis, because I think his role in the story is something that is uniquely significant to both the story of Dawn of the New World and the story of Tales of Symphonia before it. And I, I don't feel right now, at least, as if that's true across all of the characters from the first game that they bring back to Dawn of the New World. I think it's a little uneven in the way in which they contribute and, and the role that they play in the themes that Dawn of the New World wants to think about. Um, and having them all there and involved in various ways that have uneven thematic contributions, I think, is, is part of what makes it harder to adjudicate the the um, story of Dawn of the New World as a whole. I think that's fair. Yeah, Pottery, that's a good question too. I'll say that's something that I um, I noticed more than I expected in Tales of Arise going back into it because it's something where there are like a significant number of costume changes across the various arcs uh, and the kind of main three acts of the game, especially for Alfin and Shion um, in a way that, as you say, makes a lot of sense based on the like the role that outfits play in the language of Tales storytelling. Um, but you're right, I feel like even though they're outfits and so you don't often think of them as quest lines, I think you could almost draw the distinction that one draws between main quests and side quests in a game where, yeah, they oftentimes all contribute to character development and saying different things about the characters, but it's typically the kind of development that you would get in optional content because a lot of the quests to get those outfits are exactly optional content. Um, and I think that is kind of, um, I don't want to say sad, but it's, it's a choice that doesn't have to necessarily be the case in long games with distinct arcs where, you know, characters oftentimes change their perspective on themselves and the world. Uh, I think it says a lot about Velvet that we've talked about in the Berseria stream so far that she stays locked into this prisoner's outfit that she just happened to find uh, in the prison during her escape throughout the game. So that I think it's easier to cash out as like a meaningful choice that reflects her character as opposed to something that's kind of a sad oversight or a missed opportunity. But on the whole, I... I wouldn't be disappointed if the games that we get following Arise lean more into costume changes based on act. Oh, Grail, for real, should I not fight this? Well, come on, you say that and I'm gonna definitely fight it at least once. I'll just, I'll double tap for safety on the quick save. If there's any way to get me to fight something, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and Padre, for your breaking, for your benefit, because it sounds like you might not have been here when I talked about it the first time. I think you know, take everything that we just said about like Velvet hanging on to revenge and sort of fixating on that as her not only guiding reason for existence, but also like the one maxim according to which she governs herself throughout the game and her life. I think it's really easy to 
take that and transpose it onto like her outfit as a symbol where she just, she stays in that outfit because kind of she's still in a way she's still in the prison where she starts the game, the prison of her revenge quest. And she, um, you know, she kind of lets all other aspect of herself, her character, her fashion, um, go, uh, in favor of that revenge quest. Try it once. All right, well, that didn't wasn't a great start. Yeah, thank you, Grail. I appreciate the reminder. I need all the help I can get. Though playing as Velvet, I feel like we have a chance. While we're grinding through this crack, and the other thing I'll say about the outfit changes in Arise that I find kind of interesting is like, on the one hand, for all the reasons we were just talking about, I think it's really cool that act, ch act changes correspond to outfit changes in at least the main characters. And I agree, I, I kind of find myself wishing that Kisara and, um, and Law and Dohalim and Renwell also got those act change outfits. Especially after, you know, one month passes in, like, the major time skip of the narrative. You'd think they'd at least change their clothes. Um, but I think the other kind of side that's interesting to think about to there being, like, scripted outfit changes is, you know, as in any Tales game, there are lots of different outfits that the characters can have, especially if you're a new game plusing it. But because there are those scripted outfit changes, I find myself much less willing to mess with their outfits, you know, just out of pure interest in seeing them wearing something else, because I feel like their outfits are such a more direct part of the main story. And so, yeah, like Alfin has different suits of armor and different colors to his outfit, but I don't want to mix it up mid run because it's such a narratively significant moment whenever it is that he changes outfit from, you know, like his, you know, Dan and slave rags to the outfit that the rebels find for him to his, um, like sin cleaver armor and all of those other variations. So it's like an interesting situation where even though it's cool that they foreground the outfits and they give it more agency in the narrative, it kind of makes me feel like I lose a little bit of that agency as a player, but I, I don't know if anyone else feels that or if it's just my own hang up. playing on easy mode grail i'm playing on normal i will thank you to remember that it might be your easy mode but i don't want people thinking that i'm playing with literally no level of challenge <laughs> thank you very much it's just a different level of challenge You guys are spoiling Zillia for me. <laughs> if I didn't have so much love for you, I'd be miffed. Thank you, Pink Moon Neko. It's 
fit everyone? Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> Pottery, two things can be true. <laughs> Grail, bearing in mind your challenge run though, that's like you complaining, man, you know, I did a three mile run with like 200 pounds of weights and a crown of thorns and dehydrated and like throwing up the whole time because I ate a giant meal of pasta right before like Michael Scott. And this guy just got up in a tracksuit and ran three miles like it was nothing. There was no challenge, dude. <laughs> The future doesn't belong to you! And since we're rounding the uh, three-hour mark, maybe that'll be the only Xenoblade Chronicles illusion we get in the whole stream. Hey, look at that. We got exactly one. Keeps going. Just don't step on any sea slugs, okay? Why not? What's the big deal? It's just that it isn't pretty. Their insides squish everywhere. Yikes. That sounds pretty traumatizing. Then again, if you pickle their innards, it makes for a Oh no, we got a second one. Don't be a baby. You've had worse. Ricky is angry! Try not to step on the coral. Good point. Coral is alive and needs our protection. Or maybe it's because some of it can be sold for jewelry. I didn't mean either of those reasons. Although Manon appears similar to Maclear Beach, it was formed by a completely different process. Now that you mention it, this area is covered by rocks. Maclear is just your average seashore. But man in here was made by the slow corrosion of seaside caves. They were worn away by the waves? That too. But mainly... <laughs> Come on, Grail, it's a Friday stream. That's why you show up. <laughs> known as ravening table coral. Stay in contact long enough, and they'll melt your flesh right off. <laughs> ah, so that's why it tingles every time I touch the coral. Why didn't you warn us earlier? Pottery, I would say yes. Uh... I'm in the camp where being way too far into the Xenoblade Chronicles series, um, I, I've kind of wrapped all the way back around to not being a purist, so I would be one to say if you really just want to dive into Xenoblade Chronicles 3, it's fine and you'll probably have a great time. It is definitely the kind of game that deeply rewards players who have very recently played Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2 because they're both at play in really um, interesting and robust and like narratively fascinating ways. So I would say if, if you really want to get into the series and think about it in the way that we're thinking about stuff in Tales of Praxis or that I do in my work on Xenoblade Chronicles on With a Terrible Fate, uh, you owe it to yourself to play all three and you won't regret it. Um, but if you really want to dive into the third one, I don't think anyone has the right to call you out for it. Robbie said, have you been taking care of that rhino stagros like a good boy? Of course. I make sure to feed it every night before I go to sleep. Since it's nocturnal. How long are you going to <laughs> Yeah, speaking of Bible Grail. Something I like that. Know. It's a new kind of beetle, so it's gonna be hard to tell if it's really a pottery for whatever it's worth. I know exactly what you mean, and I would not say that the Xenoblade Chronicle series is like that. Um I think they all hold up really well. The definitive edition of the first one did a really good job of adding quality of life uh, and updating things so that it doesn't feel like that. And I think that's a big part of why they took the time to release it. Um, and also, while they're all very deeply related games, they're all independent games in terms of having their own sorts of world, their own things to say, their own systems. And so it doesn't feel like each one is just an improvement on the last one. It feels like they're very different games that are worth experiencing on their own terms so i definitely I, I don't feel like it's a downgrade to go back to the first one after the third one
Alright, show me the bug, and I'll tell you what it is. Miss Mogilu says you need to open up its outer wings and get a good whiff of the thin underwing. Ugh. Uh, I'm pretty sure I remember rhinoceros and stag beetles smelling really nasty under their wings. Is it really that bad? Why not find out for yourself? Uh, no thanks. Yeah, no pottery. This was just, um, this was in the aftermath of, uh, of the demon that they found in the forest when they were looking for the herbs to cure their sickness on the ocean. From the, from the last stream we did. Ha, <laughs> speaking of zesty. Just let him do it, Lafayette. He's already volunteered. I can do this. Just you watch. <laughs> this smell is the most bad, bad thing that ever bad, bad in it. Whoa! He fainted with his eyes still open. Well, well, well. Hey, if it isn't the consequences of his own actions. <laughs> I don't think it's the worst thing for the two of them to run together. If anything, I feel like that uh, that contributes to the conversation between them all the better. It'd be interesting to get your uh, your experience on it. Yeah, pottery for whatever it's worth. The only thing I can do to further sell you on it beyond what Grail is saying is uh, if you want to play a JRPG series where you know you'll have a constant outlet for talking about it. For as long as we're doing Tales of Praxis and any streaming stuff on With a Terrible Fate, I will always be happy to talk Xenoblade Chronicles to death, as Grail knows um, embarrassingly well. <laughs> I spy with my little eyes a kiddo who's fine. It's the perennial problem of the list, oh, right? Sorry. <laughs> Can never get through it all. I, just couldn't help it. I know that feeling. What are those books anyway? Oh, that's a great question. Since you asked. I'll reveal the secrets of my tomes just for you. On the right, I've got my household ledger in the back and my magic encyclopedia in the front. <laughs> oil blotting paper. What's oil blotting paper? It's a girl thing. The two on the left are my... Oh, yeah, Shulk. Get stuck in. <laughs> a super pop-up book. When you open it, it pops out with the force of a raging river. When an enemy has me cornered, I can just open it up a nearby wall and pop instant getaway the only downside is that it's a real pain to try to get closed again so i haven't used it in years i think it's fair to say we're all really feeling it though that's actually am i right all of you really seared into its batter are precious bits of knowledge eating it is just as good for your brain as it is for your stomach talk about brain food i had no idea that was possible he's taking this so seriously i almost feel bad all of your books are so interesting, Moggy Lou. That's really cool. There's no end to your curiosity, is there? Mm -hmm. What do you say? Want to take a closer look? Boy, would I. If you really do, then say, Moggy Lou, I want to get to know you better. Moggy Lou, I want to get to know you better. All right, I accept. I'll reveal to you my most private secret. Grail was immediately kicked off of the Bionis, never to return. Wow. I wouldn't have ever guessed that. What the? <laughs> what are you doing? What is going on with the skit? <laughs> he said he wanted to see me, so I'm showing him. You have no right to stand in the way of his desires. It's my job to protect him as his vessel, especially from someone so wicked as yourself. Also, what you're doing runs contrary to public decency, <laughs> which is not supposed to be decent. These bindings with the locks on them. This style used to be really popular during the Meliodas dynasty. Now that I know you're such a bad influence for him, I'll be keeping a closer eye on you. If you can't learn to take it easy, nobody's ever going to want to marry you, you know. Like you're a shining example of marriage material yourself. Hey, Mogilu, could you turn them over one more time? I want to see how the books attach to your belt. Yeah, sure. <sighs> <laughs> Luffy said the most innocent lamb in the world. Also, the idea that anyone in this party would be like prioritizing marriage as their end goal in the world. 
Also, Grail, what's your take on this? Because I know we've, we've rounded the three-hour mark, and I know you've also recently played this. Do you think it's it's worth seeing through the end of this dungeon? Are we imminent, or ought we to call it for the night and uh, and wait for Monday hey, to wrap this up? I was wondering about that book you have on your waist. The one you called your heavy book for flower pressings. Your curiosity truly knows no bounds, does it, kiddo? Okay, nobody else knows this, but since you're so interested, I'd hate to leave you hanging. My heavy book, the one I use for flower pressings, is none other than... I guess it is kind of cute that Lafayette said is just this genuinely interested in books, and like no one can really believe that. But he's actually just about the best Moloch poet around. Some people even call him the Great Norman Poet. Here, I'll read you my favorite one. If there is something unimportant happening to the East, I'm made to go... Oh, that's true. That's a good point, Potter. If there is something unimportant happening to the West, I'm made to go there and back. I can never rest nor be at peace. Every day my life is a living hell. Do the Norman Carina as that's penance. heavy stuff, isn't it? That's what makes it so good for pressing flowers. It's so wonderfully, oppressively heavy. Moggy Lou? Your face has gone all sinister looking. All right, that's fair. Well, I think I'll say while we're still wandering the area and because we're uh, already rounding 10 minutes past the three hour mark and I want to be respectful of the schedule for the whole real life JRPG party's sake and not feel like you have to push your personal schedules in order to not miss anything on the stream, I will wrap it up here for the evening. Walk home, man. I, I can always count on you, good good friends in the stream, to uh, give me ever new um, series titles. That's one that I have never ever heard of, but I'll have to add it to the list. Coming for you, Pottery. Well, if it's one that you recommend, at least I guess that's that's not um, tantamount to a recommendation. What you just said. Um, yeah, a wonderful Friday night stream, my friends. Um, not not racing through the story in leaps and bounds, but. Honestly, that's a good counterbalance to my uh, rush through of Tales of Arise. So different strokes. And it's nice to be able to take some time to dwell on these characters and think about their development, uh, their esoteric studies, especially at this point when they're starting to understand not only their relationships with each other, but also just beginning to uncover the history of the world. That's always such a, a magic part of JRPGs and especially the Tales games for me, and I think one of my favorite parts. So I'm not surprised that we spent some time dwelling on that. Uh, hopefully, y'all enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm sure we'll make a lot more progress through the second act and wrestling with a lot of this stuff um, on Monday and next week uh, and beyond. All right, good looking out, Pottery. Uh, wow, I I read. It slaps, and I was not expecting the end of that message to go to sword lesbians in space, but <laughs> I will I will add it to the list. Oh my goodness. Never a dull moment with you, my friends. I, it's, it's a real question, like, of all of the possible parties in these JRPGs, how does our real-life JRPG party stack up? And I think we're definitely, uh, you know, true to the Tales games, getting some more personality and quirks and jokes and insight and all the good stuff that these JRPG parties get as we push further along in Tales of Praxis, uh, which is such a joy for me. Um, dear friends, Grail, Pottery, Pink Moon Neko, so nice to have the representation uh, on a chill Friday evening working through the ins and outs of Berseria. Um, we're, well, just nerds you say, Grail, but Nerds with very different approaches to these games, a, a common appreciation for a work of art, um, but with a lot of nuances in between, just like these fine members of this JRPG party, all of whom have their own interests, but alignment in a single mission that they're undertaking. So gotta love some good symmetry. Um, I will definitely be thinking about all of the different you know, um, considerations and points of continuity that we raised between a lot of the different Tales games. I think this was a fantastic stream for that. Also, I think we raised a lot of stuff that is worth mulling uh, about the differences that are coming up and just 
points of contention really between Tales of Zisteria and Tales of Berseria. So let that be your homework. Uh, if you dwell on this at all over the weekend, let's all think a little bit more about um, you know, remembering what Zisteria was trying to say in terms of the relationship between uh, concepts like malevolence and concepts like morality and how they interact and don't reduce to one another. And now that we're starting to learn more about like the, the deep history of this world and also see more of the colors of these characters in terms of the good and bad things they're doing, but also how those connect up with their intentions and actions, um, what those games might be teeing up in terms of intertextual relationships between them. And maybe, just maybe, who knows, we uh, might get into some esoteric exegetical practices of our own uh, this coming week and on the streams beyond. Uh, God knows this is, this is good eaten for all of that. Um, all right, my dear friends, thank you for a great stream. Thank you for your insights on all things to do with the philosophy of game narrative. Uh, I'm Aaron Saduko, the founder of With a Terrible Fate. Uh, and truly, I know I've said this many times, but Tales of Praxis is not just about digging into and understanding these games and the value that they have for the language of video game storytelling, um, but also especially uncovering you know, the meaning of them and how they've informed us as players, not just as individuals, but more to the point of the Tales games themselves as communities of players. So really, thank you so much for that. I uh, can't tell you how grateful I am. Hope to see you all back here on Monday with bells on 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm sure Grail will be early because that's Grail's whole gig. But let me charge you all with uh, trying to beat Grail to the punch with the first message. That can be the uh, the challenge to kick us off uh, and get the ball rolling with some energetic analysis on Monday. Until then, dear friends, game well, think well. Have an awesome weekend. Uh, check out the new content um, on Tales of Symphonia if you haven't seen it, or Tales of the Abyss if you have time to crack that one and want to talk about it next week on withaterriblefate.com. Uh, and new stuff coming soon, uh, obviously, as pertains to Tales of Arise and the lecture that we'll be giving, and also Tales of Vesperia and Tales of Destiny. That's still in the works, so lots of good times ahead. Thank you, my friends. Have a great evening. Till next time. Cheers. <laughs>